Okay, everybody find your seat. We're about ready to start. And that's so, uh, where are the students? Students, raise your hand. Students are here. Where are the teachers? Yeah, most of the teachers are still missing. So the record will show the students were here and the teachers were late. On that. Well, lunch was terrific, wasn't it? Rod Shaw, wow, what a day this has been. What a day this has been. And the afternoon is only going to get better. So uh, I want to uh, uh, invite our uh, first panel to uh, come up onto the stage, please. And a uh, member of our Council of Advisors, uh, Dr. Stephen Leith, the president of Auburn University. Everybody now say, War Eagle. War Eagle. That, that's what, if you're from Auburn, that's what you say. Uh, greeting. And uh, there, and Rob Fraley. And uh, Dr. Leith is going to be the moderator for this panel. He'll introduce everyone. And then later this afternoon, you know, before we go to the Capitol, I have to run upstairs and change. So uh, he's going to step back in as the master of ceremonies. So, Dr. Leith, over to you. Well, good afternoon, folks. We've got an important set of topics to discuss today. We've seen many changes in technologies over the last 20, 30 years. We're in the golden age of biotechnology, and there's many other technologies that are affecting agriculture, but we've probably uh, been slower to getting that technology to smallholder farmers than we would like or that... Um, we can, and so that's what we're going to talk about today. And I've got three panelists with me today. You've got their long bios in front of you, but briefly, I'll uh, introduce my panel members. First, Enoch Shakava, Deputy Director of Agricultural Development at the Gates Foundation. Um, he has had a long career in Africa, Europe, United States. Um, and now he's responsible for developing poverty-reducing systems, services, and partnerships, primarily in sub-Saharan Africa and also in Asia. So we're thrilled to have you with us today. Sitting to his left is Dr. Rob Fraley. Many of you have seen him before. Rob is a 2013 World Food Prize laureate. We're always glad to have one of our laureates on stage. Some of them call him the father of agricultural biotechnology, much deserved, over 100 publications and patents in this field, and truly a thought leader in not only agriculture, but agricultural biotechnology. And then to Rob's left is Dr. Howard Yana Shapiro, who's the chief agricultural officer at Mars. Mars, as many of you know, is a global company with a broad product line in foods, confectionaries, pet foods, and other things. And he's got a broad portfolio there where he's responsible for plant genetics, integrated pest management, biocontrol, water conservation, and many sustainability issues. Um, interesting, before that, he served as Vice President of Agriculture and Vice President of Research for Seeds of Change, and that's an organization that he founded with his wife. And we're glad to have these panelists with us today. In the interest of time, I'd like to dive right in. And uh, Rob, if you're willing to kick it off for you, us, what I'd like you, uh, maybe to start on is, we've had all these technologies for years, and we keep getting more, and we've been slow to getting the small holder farmers. So what's different about today? What makes you optimistic that we can deliver these technologies? Great. Well, I, I think I'd, I'd just frame it in a couple of things. So there's, you know, there's never been a, a more important time as we think about uh, food security and agricultural innovation when we look at the challenges of both, uh, you know, feeding a growing population, but also farming better and smarter and more sustainably. But I think what makes this time so special and so unique is just the absolute explosion of new technology coming into ag and the very few barriers, particularly financial and cost, that, that allow us to exploit it. You know, on the, on the biology side, you know, just a couple of ways to think about it. You know, when they first sequenced the human genome, uh, it was a million dollars, nearly a billion dollars if you really added it up. Today in our labs, we can sequence for $10 enough of a corn genome to map and breed from. And so the, the cost curves have changed dramatically, and that allows the applicability 
I think, to, to literally all the world's uh, crops. And you throw on top of that some of the use of artificial intelligence to come up with better, faster breeding regimes, I, I think it can be pretty, uh, pretty remarkable. And then you, you look at the great, I think, democratization that tools like gene editing are gonna have, I think it really causes us to rethink how we use advanced biology and breeding techniques for all crops, for smallholder crops around the world. And then you, you shift over and you look at the, the digital and the data science tools. I mean, literally every farmer's field in the world now has been mapped. And we're starting to understand the soil and all the different components. Um, everyone's well aware that the cell phone explosion has, has touched the, the smallest farmers in the world. And they now have the ability to get agronomic information, pricing information, weather information that's never been possible. I just think the, uh, the, uh, what's going on is, is, is amazing. You know, just the, the last little, uh, uh, piece I, I tie into this that you may not be aware of, but in the, in the last three years, there's been over $10 billion of private and venture capital investment in new startup ag and food technology companies. There's literally a thousand new companies on the face of the earth now that are studying microbes, they're doing gene editing, they're building sensors or satellites. And all of these are available, I think, at a cost position that can impact farmers right here in Iowa, but farmers across the globe in India and Africa. This is the time to take advantage of just unparalleled technology advancement in agriculture. Enoch Howard, you share that optimism? Well, I'm, I'm an optimist uh, largely because I'm a plant breeder. Every plant breeder has to be an optimist. It, <laughs> If, if you go back to the early days of plant breeding when you would walk a field with 10,000 plants grading them and you would remember doing that, some of us still do, that was how we made the, our first decisions. And the first sequencers were the size of a school bus. And now you could backpack a small sequencer into a field and get information. So everything is, is moved very quickly. What hasn't kept up was, is a body of people to use the information to use the tools, to be able to extrapolate and create new varieties. And, and this leads to the whole question of caloric density in plant breeding or nutritional density in plant breeding. And I think one of the things we have to really recognize is you can eat calories and you can be malnourished. But what we need to do as a collective group is work on the nutrition side. I mean, we have brilliant yield potential in Africa, in India, and all over Asia based on work that companies like Rob represents and others, Syngenta, what have you. But the reality is we haven't worked on nutrition. So with all these tools, now is the moment to work on nutrition. We need zinc to stop cretinism. We need vitamin A to stop night blindness. We need iron for hemoglobin development. And we need folates for neural tube development. So we have this situation right now with all the tools in the world, if we don't take advantage of them, increase the nutritional value. And it's not just maize and soybeans and the big five. It's all the food which is the backbone of a system. And we were talking before we came out here about systems. The food system in Africa in particular is based on hundreds of varieties of foods that are eaten every day. So there needs to be an impact in that area as well. So talking about systems, I know you folks at Gates and Nick have worried about systems and do we have the systems in place to really integrate these technologies in Africa? Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, yes, so I'm equally you know, fired up because I think this is the right time um, so, again, like in African, there's a story. If you see an African in the U.S., and particularly here in Des Moines, and you spend five minutes with them, there's actually a long story. And I think the, the overarching theme here is there is that pathway out of poverty. And you find that you've got isolated cases. I have my own story. Growing up on a farm, four hectares, 11 children, 
uh, getting all the income out of farming. We had to be smarter at that level. And it, you know, when we started 200 kg yield, now I'm proud that my dad is now getting eight tons per hectare. Oh, tremendous. So it's not different from an Iowa farmer. There's been a lot of changes along the way. But then the problem is I have one story out of uh, a village of 50 people. You go to another village, you pick up one story, one story. So you've got isolated stories. So that's why we need to come up with a highway. We need a bigger story. How can we take people out of poverty at scale? And you can't do that if people are still operating in isolated boxes, especially when you get into public breeding. I'm sure there is a private sector and public sector you know, breeding. And both systems are developing newer products, very rich pipeline, which could change the lives of the people at the farm level. And private sector, I'm sure they'll reach about 20, 30% of most of the smallholder farmers. The bulk is still maybe going to be driven by the public sector. And we need the public breeding system. We need to create a system with several players. From the time you do the breeding and you do the delivery and then the promotion of adoption. And I think the, the donor community has also been a culprit in the past that we created competition between the CG system, and then Agra is doing something else, the ATF is doing something, the ITA is doing several things. But now we are beginning to think this in terms of a system, that we all want to do the same thing. But maybe we need to divide each other responsibilities and begin to have a very clear handoff. You know, who, who does what in that system? And I'm sure this came up earlier on in terms of the alignment among the key goals and then partnering for the common success. I'm sure we are beginning to see one common theme that this is the time to do so. So see, that's one thing. The second thing is about also the governments are getting ready more and more. I think for many years we've been talking about only food security. But we are now talking about uh, country-led, inclusive agricultural transformation. And transformation takes long, very long time. So we are beginning to see some of the governments, you are thinking of agriculture as an investment area, not a drain to the fiscus. And what they're investing in agriculture for the long haul, 10 to 15 years, you know, they need to put their resources there. They need to build the requisite capacity so that when technologies f can now flow seamlessly within those systems, because often the government could be that elephant in the room through wrong policies, regulations. But I'm glad that this is the moment because the language is more unified around we have a problem and we all have a role to play, but systems will then help us to know who does what in that system. You know, while we're on that topic, you touched about different roles of folks in that system, public and private. I'm guessing our other guests have some feel for public-private partnerships in moving this technology forward. Any comments in that area? This is a slide uh, that's up now of the African Orphan Crops Consortium. It's an uncommon collaboration. Uh, you look at the names of the people who are collaborating. This is all being done specifically to improve 101 food crops simultaneously in Africa. This is the backbone of the food system chosen by African scientists, uh, anthropologists, food scientists, sociologists, and farmers groups. So this represents what I consider to be the future. Uh, pretty odd bedfellows, if you will. Uh, I want to call out Agra in particular, which has started over 100 seed companies in Africa, so that the work that this group does includes an African Plant Breeding Academy where we bring 
uh, some of the best and brightest women and men. The current class has 18 women and 17 men in it. To our Plant Breeding Academy held at ICRAF in Nairobi, one of the CG centers. And three times a year for two weeks, they're trained and led by uh, the distinguished plant breeder, Rita Mum, formerly of the University of Illinois. They go back and they have all the tools. We've sequenced these crops, 101 crops. We've finished 47 sequences now. We have breeding programs on 56 crops, basically driving nutrition first. Understanding that yield is critical. We can't forget yield. And this funny word that people talk about called resilience. Water use efficiency and nutrient use efficiency. And then pest and disease resistance. This group of 100 who have already graduated from the academy have already built the African Plant Breeding uh, Association network. So they're talking to each other. So for them, the first time in their lives, they know who is working in Africa on these sorts of problems. What are they working on? Bambara, critical protein source all over Africa. Spider plant. And re referring back to uh, Akina Adesina's comment about agroecosystems going across Africa as opposed to borders, these are the foods that go across those agroecosystems. Baobab, many of you have never probably eaten baobab, but the leaves are really delicious in the time of an extreme drought when nothing else will grow. Cocoa yams. So the foods of Africa are being improved nutritionally first. But this is the methodology. These are the kinds of organizations being put together. Everyone has the same vote. There is no directorate. There is no leader. We meet twice a year as a board for consensus voting to do the work. The reference genomes are done by BGI, one of the powerhouses on Earth. All the resequencing, 10,000 resequences, are done in Nairobi by African scientists, African technicians, doing the work, all available free, all available in the public domain, so everyone has access to improve those crops. This, for me, is the future. Rob, what's your take on public-private partnerships in a role like this to help solve these issues? Well, I, um, I think it's absolutely uh, essential. Nobody has all of the capability, all the resources, all the ability to position, you know, within within a given country. So it takes everybody working together. You know, my my experience has largely been uh, has largely been based on the you know the ten year collaboration that we've had with USAID and the Gates Foundation and Agra and Summit to build the uh, the uh, water efficient maize breeding program for Africa. You know, 10 years later, this has become the, uh, the largest independent breeding program in Africa for corn. It's releasing hundreds of new high-yielding uh, hybrids, and it's all built on using a lot of these modern advanced breeding tools. And I think in many ways, it's a template for what we can now do for the next crops. And I think one of the things that, that we can now do with the cost curves of these technologies coming down so dramatically, you know, the opportunity you know, to systematically step back and plan and build the capability for really doing this across the broad scope of, uh, of African crops is now possible. It's feasible to do. And that, for me, that's, uh, that's really, uh, really exciting. And, uh, you know, there's, uh, there's so much that, that can be done and so much that needs to be done. I know some of the sidebars at this meeting have been to, you know, address some of the unique challenges that we're facing with, uh, with armyworm in, in Africa. And again, that's an, another, I think, really incredible opportunity for collaborations that bring the best of what we can do with breeding, with biotech, with chemistry, with biologicals, with IPM to, uh, you know, to address a, a really important challenge. But I think there's uh, both, you know, the, the fact that the technology is now ready and real and affordable. Um, in many ways, the, the barriers become, um, you know, as Dr. Shapiro said, making sure, we, as always, the capacity building. Um, I would say that in, certainly in the case of the biotech and the gene editing tools, the, the regulatory environment. But one of the areas that, that we have seen, and I know, you know, going back to discussions decades ago with 
Norm Borlaug when, when he and the team were trying to introduce the, uh, the quality protein maize into Africa, being able to now to marry what, what I think could become very, very sophisticated, effective breeding programs. We now need to address seed production in a pan-African way, and I know Enoch's an expert on this, so I'll let him uh, build on that. Yeah, why don't we talk about seed production a little bit, and we can go back and talk about some of the barriers later, but let's, let's talk about that, Ian. So we spent a, a, a maybe the past two years just analyzing the seed system, um, again, to understand what are the root causes of failure. I looked at 11 countries, we did that together with the USID, and we realized that there are three main barriers to the seed system. Firstly, there's lack of coordination between the various players, those who do breeding, and then they need to pass it on to the next level. So, so that was one bucket. The second bucket, which is very consistent for all staples and even some of the vegetatively propagated you know, varieties, was around the early generation seed. And maybe I'll explain a little bit here. Um, that all the work of breeding, which, takes, which can take seven, now it's shorter because of these tools, but then we'll produce five kg of breeder seed. Now, how do you take that five kg and maintain the, you know, those qualities and multiply to 1,000 tons, you know, which can be used over the life of that variety, which can be 15 to 20 years. So maintaining that quality and, and ensure that many other seed farmers can benefit from it has been a major bottleneck, especially for most of the public uh, breeding systems. So we knew we had a pipeline coming from Wema, DTMA, and various other products. But also in the delivery site, in the last mile, we had Agrag, who created 114 smaller seed companies. Very, very useful, and i give you a quick example here. Uh, in Malawi, in 2004, when I was responsible for the, some, business, some business there, uh, the adoption rate of hybrids was 8%. But we only had the three regional big companies. And the company I worked for at 75% of 8%. So, which again didn't make sense. So, but the coming in of Agra in 2006 created seven new smaller seed companies. And when I, when I left the country in 2008, after five years, the adoption rate was 45%. So, there was now a market for everybody, and you know, but. The, the, the bottleneck on the early generation seed, when you have 100 seed companies, each one without any capacity to be handling from breeder seed to commercial seed, we then had to think very creatively. So we came up with this uh, innovative way of solving a common problem to all these seed companies. So we created a specialized uh, foundation seed company, which is called the Quali Basic Seed, which is a, which is a best in Nairobi by taking care of all the seed companies in East and Southern Africa. Because they all have one common problem, and again, this is where we have philanthropy coming in to identify what is really failing in the system. We can use the philanthropic funding to remove those bottlenecks, but also ensure that it is sustainable. You know, it is going to be continuing even after the funding. So that is going to be five years, and then it is going to be, uh, you know, to be spun off. And we're hoping that all these seed companies will be benefiting when it is still a grant, will then buy a stake within the company, and then it can run. We looked at other models, like the Illinois Foundation seed here in India, which is similar. But in Africa, this is the first of its kind, which is going to be solving a common problem in a very sustainable way. So talking about partnerships, and I, we normally talk about PPP, which is a private public, uh, public you know, partnership. I ate another P. We need philanthropy <laughs> in there. And, and philanthropy does not give money. It invests in return for a model which is sustainable. So more and more we are looking at those innovative ways 
of, um, of removing what is failing in the system. So I'll say that's one great example. And I'll, I'll give you two more, and then maybe that's it. Okay. Uh, uh, in cassava, you can clean up all these viruses, and we've done great work, and we now have a lot of cassava varieties. But then if you clean the material, and then as it is distributed, it is mixed with un, uh, unclean, you know? The clean and unclean mixed. Everything we have cleaned over in the past five years is then reinfested. So the first step is to make sure that we create new standards in some of these informal you know, seeds. Like cassava, I mean, you don't know, there's no formal system. So we call it formalizing the informal seed system. So, so we are now creating new standards, new grades in cassava, in yam, and we have some, some of very, very excellent, innovative models in, in Tanzania, in Uganda, uh, as well as in Nigeria and Ghana for the yam. And we think more and more, that is what philanthropy should do, find out what is not working well, work together with the government and many other partners, and remove those bottlenecks. If we do a good job, it should sustain itself and the crowd in private sector, and then becomes a, a self-sustaining you know, mechanism. So when we think of all these crops that need breeding assistance, and we've got to prioritize them and fund them, and Rob, you've probably encountered a regulatory barrier or two in your career. So realistically, if we sit in the audience and think, is it realistic to deliver these technologies across numerous countries in short order? What do you see as the barriers, or can we really get this done? Well, again, kind of going back to the model that, that we've worked on with the WEMA project. So, you know, as I said, WEMA was, is this large collaboration to develop uh, drought tolerance uh, maize for Africa. It includes both breeding advances as, as includes biotech as well. So uh, biotech drought genes. And then, you know, when we talk about the system, you know, challenges, I was saying somewhere earlier, if you have this great field of green drought resistant corn, it's going to be the first thing that the insects will go after. So you have to build in, you know, insect control traits and those technologies have been uh, donated uh, as well to the, uh, to the WEMA project uh, with the hopes that um, with a collective effort, we can start to look at pan-African approvals so that not every individual country needs to develop that capability, but that there could be enough cross-representation that you can do some of these things at a, uh, you know, at a, uh, at a multi-country level. Is I think that- Is that happening? It's, it's starting to happen, and we're in the various uh, final phases of various uh, you know, sign-offs and, and final approvals, but that's certainly one of the ways of reducing costs and also expanding and amplifying the benefits of the, uh, of the technology. And we've, we've been able to see that happen. It's not uncommon for that approach to work with the pharmaceutical industry as well for, for pan-African approvals. So that's, that's one thing to think about. And then I think the, uh, you know, the other important thing is a, uh, that's, you know, that's, uh, that's the focus, you know, based on a biotech or, or a GMO approach. You know, I'm sure there's been lots of discussions at the meeting, you know, with the rapid advances that are being made in gene editing, mm -hmm. you know, those need to also be built into this system. You know, already in the, uh, in the U.S., the, uh, the USDA has approved, uh, I think, 11 different gene edited uh, food products. Uh, many companies are uh, are uh, involved in that, but you know, gene editing is, uh, you know, as you all know, it's a tool that's being used broadly by virtually every scientist who studies biology in the world. So I think it has the uh, it has the unique opportunity to democratize access to technology in much the same way we're seeing with the digital tools. Okay. You know, with and so. You know, I, I hope that the, uh, the combination of, um, you know, 20 plus years of experience with, you know, biotech crops around the world without any single, you know, food or feed safety issue with the ability to do, you know, you know pan-African approvals to, to help reduce the, uh, the, uh, the cost and accelerate the distribution. And then really uh, a thinking in the future that, you know, these, these new, advanced, next-generation biotech tools 
uh, neither warrant nor deserve the cost and the scrutiny that, that have been forced on the first generation. Howard, what about you? Especially with all these crops we have to look at. I, I, I love gene editing. I, I'm glad I lived long enough to have it come into my world. Well, you get <laughs> four years left in you. You know, when you, when you think about what it can do, the, and yesterday uh, the gentleman from the Broad talked about it. I'm part of the West Coast gene editing group with Jennifer Doudna, and we have projects because much of the work we're talking about can be lost to aflatoxin, fumonisins, and okratoxin 1A. When you think about that, all the work that we're really talking about, if it doesn't have aflatoxin resistance, it's lost whether it's in storage or in the field coming out. And the jury's still out on the total efficacy of biocontrol in the soil. Gene editing allows this to happen. You can actually go in and gene edit out with the targeted RNAi, the receptor genes for aflatoxin. So when aflatoxin knocks on the door, the plant says you can't come in. There's no place for it to go. Aflatoxin in the United States in a good year, uh, in a bad year for maize is a billion six dollars in losses. A billion six. So in Africa they say 450 million a year, but that's underreported because there's no rural sector. Aflatoxin causes liver cancer, the biggest cause of liver cancer in Nigeria, impacts immunosuppression of, of a healthy body, likely is related to stunting. Stunting is all part of this when we start to think about being able to deliver nutritious food, high yielding, resilient to climate change to a community, whether it's India. And it turns out 37% of the rural sector children are stunted. 37%. It's, it's unconscionable. They won't be Norman Borlaug. They won't be Barbara McClintock. Their neural tubes don't develop. They won't have the intellectual, the physical, or the economic power to move forward. India is 48% in the rural sector. 48%, 80% anemia is generally across the whole population of India. When you think that what gene editing might do to solve these problems, it's almost a hallelujah moment, really, to be honest. And then in storage, we have to figure out storage. So on Monday, we launched a project on Foldit which is a website for protein folding. I would encourage you all to go to Fold It. It's a gamer site. 460 people play these games. They've made phenomenal discoveries that no computer can match and no academic institution has ever matched on creating unique enzymes in proteins. So we're trying to develop new enzymes, new folded proteins that will actually detect aflatoxin and degrade it. It's a game. You should go on this site and see what's going on. It's the most advanced game I've ever seen in my life. And these people who are not biochemists have no idea that they can't do it. <laughs> it's an advantage. So when, when I start to think about things like this that are going on, and then on the other extreme, the Great Green Wall, which is an, uh, a program in Africa that you may or may not be aware of, the Great Green Wall is agroecosystems where people are actually planting nitrogen-fixing trees. And in Malawi, as a good example, they've increased the yields three to eight times with essentially no fertilizer, just using these nitrogen-fixing trees after three years. They lose their leaves in the summer when they would compete with the maize, and they put them on in the winter. This was driven by Dennis Garrity, the former DG at Aircraft as well. So there's very complicated things that we're talking about that are democratized, which is a great word that Rob used. Every biology department, including high schools, almost in the, in the United States, is looking at gene editing. And then you have the Great Green Wall, which will deliver fertilizer without having a truck come down a highway, which is impassable. So it's this mixture, and its systematics go back to Enoch's point. If we don't take a systematic approach to this, if we don't understand why governments get in the way, if we don't understand why there's not translation to scale, if we don't understand why there's not adoption, if we don't figure these small pieces out together, then I think we really will not see the benefit that everyone in this room and everyone on this stage believe is possible. And that's the reason for optimism. 
because the tools are available, the will is available, now it's the translation to scale that's available, and the big donors in this room, like USAID, they're, they're important players. The Gates Foundation, private industries like ourselves and, and Monsanto. None of this is possible without this, what I call uncommon collaborations. Do you gentlemen think the smallholders are ready for this? Do they know this technology is even available to them or possible for them at their level? Or is that an educational effort that needs to go out from all of us? So, so, I mean, uh, smallholder farmers are rational business people. And, and I can talk about my own sure. experience here. That uh, to raise the maize yield on a smallholder farm from 200 kg to currently 8 tons per hectare, it has been a lot of learning. And, I, and again, I'm privileged that, you know, I studied agriculture, worked for a farmer's union, understood what was failing in the system. And of course, spent a lot of time even educating my own parents. You know, each time I'll buy a bag of seed. Now they know that uh, uh, for them to keep up with the climate change, they need to plant newer varieties. I mean, we call it variety or turnover. But it is how do we package that information and, and, and then deliver it to uh, people with very little education, people who are dispersed geographically, people isolated from markets and so on. And, and I think that's where we have the huge promise of uh, digital technology. And right now, uh, at the Gates Foundation, we uh, working on a portfolio which we call digital pharma services. Again, taking advantage of uh, the proliferation of new tools and technologies. We can reach farmers at scale. We need to develop bigger platforms. We we'll find that every service provider is developing an application. A, a seed company just to sell their own seed. Fertilizer company to sell their own. So if each one is just developing these small applications, it's going to be costly. But how about creating a highway where all these small applications can be loaded onto? And then everyone benefits from that uh, big platform, and then we share the cost, and then we are reaching smallholder farmers with specific messages, which are timely. I mean, for example, rather than explaining the signs behind changing varieties. You can just have a, a, a one line which says, as you walk into your distribution uh, point, or if you go to an agro dealer, ask when that variety was released. Anything which is older than 10 years, it means you're planting a variety which was bred under completely different conditions than this season. So, so we can use all that and then begin to package that into, into messages which can be delivered by SMSs. We've got a lot of examples in Kenya, in Ethiopia, Digital Green, in India. They're already you know, taking these messages and package them. So I'll say that's one, one big thing. The second big thing is, uh, again, I mean, we have learned this again in development that government is very, very important. Because we cannot be more interested in reducing poverty than the governments themselves. If that is the case, we will not be successful. And I'm sure we try to do that a lot. So this country-led means we are actually helping the government to become successful. And I've realized that even within the uh, regulatory environment, the ability to package that information and communicate it to the politicians in the way they can own the message and use it for their own benefit. And say, you know what, I am bringing this new technology because I want you to become successful. It's different from maybe another company say, I'm doing it because I mean, they, they think there's always a profit motive, which is not bad. Or if it is a donor organization, so oh, you are now you know, having the vision over the country. 
So, so we need to be smarter at how do we package the evidence, how do we package the data, how do we package all these things and let the government own it. In any case, the government spend more money than the donors do. If their money is in the right places, you will see countries starting to take off. And that's one conversation that we have with Agra, I'm sure uh, and Agnes mentioned that in terms of their role, it is going to be around engaging government, but also packaging it in such a way that they own it, they are seen to be driving the ag transformation process, you realize that they will do many other things in support of the technology. The third thing is about what you call it, gene editing, I learned a, a ton you know, this week. Maybe just by calling it gene editing, you're already, you're already starting from a wrong perspective. People say, hey, genes, you're editing them, you're deleting certain things, you're editing others. We need to be smarter at what do we call it. You know, when we deliver it, let's call it something which is easier to understand, and they can own the message and run with it. Well, you make a point. I think we did start some of those on a, a bad premise, and when we talk about gene editing, gene silencing, it, some in the public will ask the question, is that a GMO? What does it mean? And I think there are issues of communication. Um, is that a barrier to making some of these technologies acceptable in some countries, just a lack of understanding or a fear of them? You know, I think it can be. On the other hand, I think we're farmers, uh, you know, have experienced the tools. Uh, you know, we've seen a huge difference. You know, I grew up on a small farm in Illinois. I've been in agriculture and farming all my life. I mean, I don't think I've ever met a farmer yet who didn't want to uh, grow more, who wanted to, you know, leave that land to their uh, to their kids or, or, or continually, you know, innovate and and uh, and and do more. Um, I don't think the, the the I think the challenge is is removing a lot of the barriers. Um, you know, in India today, you know, we've operated a, uh, a uh, electronic communication to farmers. You know, we, we reach four million smallholder farmers literally every day with a text message. They're, they're ready to use the technology. They want to know better agronomy. They want to know market prices. Uh, in the case of the project I mentioned with WEMA, I mean, you know, hundreds of thousands of farmers have now planted these seeds because they're better. You know, the, the beauty of the, I think, of the advances in biology and the advances in data science and basically how they're converging together is there's never been technology that has truly such a low barrier to adoption. If you think about it, I always use the description, you, you know, you, you can, you can breed those 40,000 genes in the seed. You can put in a half a dozen or a dozen biotech traits. We'll be putting in a probably 15 or 20 gene edited traits in that seed. But in the end, you end up with a better seed and every farmer in the world knows what to do with the seed. So the barriers to adoption are pretty low. And now you look at what's happening on the digital side. I mean, it's phenomenal. I mean. 70% of the smallholders in Africa have a cell phone. We've overcome language barriers, education barriers, communication barriers. Uh, we've got a new app that's pretty cool. A farmer can now take a picture of a leaf. That picture goes up to the cloud, gets compared to about 20 million photographs, and will identify that disease within a few seconds at a 95% accuracy. Just think of what that means in terms of getting the right information, the right advice, how that can f prevent food waste, how it can increase yields. I mean, these digital tools are going to be so intuitive that, hell, we'll be using them to design, you know, inhibitors for aflatoxins and things like that. Yeah. What do you think? Well, I, I think there's, I, I want to go back to one thing first that Enoch said. It's called engaging governments. That's a theory of change. I would rather make it a change of theory and induce the governments. I'm more, much more interested in inducing them to understand what is necessary to have a healthy rural society, have a healthy rural population. Engaging sometimes is, is not, doesn't really quite get it as much as we would like to have it happen. 
in the area of technology, uh, thank goodness the cell phone came along and no one decided to cut down whatever trees are left in Africa to build telephone poles to string the lines to have wire phones. You're absolutely correct. The cell phone is, is a radical change. It's, it's, it's so amazing. They know what the prices are in commodities I'm interested in, like cacao, on the London strike. They know exactly what that price is. So when a Pistor Trateur comes by, one of the intermediate traders and says, I'll give you X, he goes, no, I'll wait, because he knows the price is 3X. And so there's, there's an ability to really move this forward at a really rapid rate. What Rob talked about, identifying with 95% accuracy, a disease is astonishing. They have soil testing kits developed by the Brooker Instrument Company in Germany for the CG aircraft in particular that can do a soil analysis of the 50, uh, first 50 elements of the periodic table in less than a minute. It used to take weeks to get a soil sample. It's also backpackable. Satellites traveling over Africa, Asia, United States at 25,000 miles an hour can tell you almost anything you want to know about a plant. And if you can write the algorithm to differentiate a pod from a leaf from a tree trunk, then you'll be able to count pods of cacao on a tree going 25 miles, 25,000 miles an hour. It's, it's incomprehensible. The question is, how democratized, how ubiquitous will this information become? How advanced will it be? And how will it be adopted by everyone? Everyone should have the, the same gameplay. It's, it's unfair to think we're going to have it because we live here and they're going to have it and they don't have it. The last point I'd make on this, we need to be careful not to romanticize the smallholder. This is a really tough situation to be a smallholder. If you're on degraded land and you're a smallholder, it is really very difficult. Are we going to have fewer smallholders in the future? I think that's probably true. I think we'll move from one to two, three hectares to five to ten hectares. I think there'll be a movement in many crops in that way. Not everywhere, but some places. So it's very important to understand that if you make less than a dollar a day, it's hard to make a good decision. If you get to three or four or five dollars a day, your decision-making tree really changes. And what we're talking about here is getting to that five to ten dollars a day for individual farmer for his family. And that's really the real revolution, is making that huge shift. We have just a couple minutes left. Any parting comments from the panelists? Well, for me, the, the, the systems thinking is very important. We need to amplify all these good stories. Today in Africa, you hear Ethiopia there, Rwanda there, two countries out of 55. We need to find something common so that we can see maybe 30 countries in the next 10 years. What do we need to do that? Uh, and I think we are beginning to understand you know, what is that recipe you know, needed, what are the minimum building blocks of a transforming economy. And we believe that the government is a, is a, is a key player we need to partner, and I think we are beginning to talk about the right things. And I'm sure, I mean, this is maybe the first time we are beginning to see even TAT being launched and several other organizations working together. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I, the, you know, the idea for, uh, for getting the panel together was to really share the, just the unbelievable transformative tools that are coming into the agricultural space and how they're game changing in all aspects. I think now really the opportunity is how do we take this to the next level from, uh, from, the, uh, from the oversight, from the organization. And what I sense just in talking to folks is there's just a huge amount of alignment agreement and interest in stepping this up and, uh, and bringing together the, uh, the, the capabilities across the, the public, uh, the private sectors to, to do this. It, it can be done. Howard? I would say, uh, from my closing comment, the word is nutrition. It's nutrition security, not food security. And it's, it's a human right to have nutrition security. 
We can't have populations that are stunted. I mean, we can't go to sleep at night thinking that we aren't trying to solve some of these problems. It's, it's incomprehensible that a, a society would allow stunted people because of interventions we know we can make that aren't being allowed to be made at the pace that we really should. So for me, that's a major piece. The other part is that the people who are going to get hit hardest in many of the cases of climate change are the poor small farmers. And somehow, notwithstanding governments here or governments there that don't believe in that, we have to also take these sorts of considerations to play in our social interactions every day. But I am still very optimistic. It's, it's what a plant breeder is. It's a, it's a walking optimism. And I'm looking right here at Gerd of Kush, and when I realize, and on my wall in my office at UC Davis, I have the diagram of what it took him to get down to his release, which is the most used rice in the world. And it was months and years and years and years of crossing. We now have the ability to shrink that down to a much faster perspective. And with all of our technologies, if we don't take advantage of it and induce these changes, we have lost an opportunity for more than a generation. Folks, I'd appreciate it if you'd thank our panelists. <laughs> Rob, thank you. Let's have another round of applause for our panel. Uh, uh, so now continuing our program, uh, let me uh, invite uh, Eric Fearwall to uh, come up uh, onto the stage for uh, official uh, introduction. Sit down, and that. <clears throat> so uh, when I came came back, retired from Cambodia to become uh, president of the World Food Prize, uh, it was very unusual to ever have CEOs or chairmen of major food or agricultural agribusiness companies come to conferences like this, as I was told. But I didn't know any better. And uh, I invited the chairman of Syngenta to come in 2001, I think Heinz Imhoff, and he, and he came. And that started a, a wonderful pattern for which I'm, I'm very grateful. We've had Mike Mack here when he was uh, chairman and CEO. And today it's my, my pleasure to welcome Eric Fearwald. Now in this case, I'm welcoming him back home because he lived in Des Moines for five years when he was the head of uh, DuPont Pioneer uh, Nutrition and Agriculture here, and uh, has had a remarkable career uh, with uh, a background of being uh, in chemical engineering and then uh, being uh, associated with, not only with uh, DuPont Pioneer and its agriculture and nutrition division, but he was also a uh, president of Ecolab cleaning and sanitation water treatment and oil and gas product services provider, chairman and president and chief executive officer of NALCO, another water treatment and oil and gas products and services company, group vice president, as I said, at DuPont, and uh, now is on the uh, board of directors of Eli Lilly Company and Crop Life International and the Swiss American Chamber of Commerce. Uh, he's come from Basel uh, to uh, address us and uh, to bring the insights on this afternoon of amazing leaderships in agriculture and agribusiness here and to provide his insights. So please join me in welcoming Eric Spearwald. <laughs> Forgive me. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Quinn, for that kind introduction. World Food Prize laureates, Council of Advisors, and honored guests, good afternoon, and thank you for this great opportunity to speak with you today. 
It's an honor to be in the company of so many exceptional individuals who have really dedicated their lives to advancing food security. And it's a tribute to the visionary work of Ambassador Quinn that this venue continues to grow in importance, allowing us all to, grow, to, draw, to, to draw inspiration from the amazing laureates like Dr. Adeshna, who has done so much to advance prosperity through agriculture in Africa. And it's great to be back in Des Moines, where I lived with my family for five wonderful years, from 2003 to 2008, while running DuPont's Agriculture and Nutrition Division. There's no place that feels more like the center of agriculture in the United States, and no place where you can see more corn and soybeans everywhere you look. <laughs> now, I want to make three points today as I reflect on what I see across agriculture. The first is that we are all very fortunate to be in this terrific industry, helping farmers safely feed the world and take care of the planet. Secondly, it's great to see the progress in agriculture from technology advances. And from our standpoint, crop protection, seeds, and digital tools that are increasing yields and reducing climate impacts. But at the same time, it's unfortunate, and I've got to say frustrating, to see continued unscientific attacks on important technologies. And these attacks can do great harm if we don't stand up for science-based decision making. Now, we're making progress with some NGOs and regulators that are focused on science and risk rather than misinformation, politics, and other factors. But we must have an open and honest discussion about what sustainable agriculture really is and not hide behind false fear-mongering that leads to bad regulations and poor practices. And that openness needs to be on all sides, including Syngenta and our competitors. The third point, it's exciting to think about the future we will create together as we keep moving technology and farming practices forward to feed all the world, helping alleviate poverty, including more in Africa. And we can do this while delivering major reductions in the 35% of all greenhouse gases that today are emitted from agriculture and the 70% of the world's fresh water that's used by agriculture. Now, let me go a little deeper into each of these three points. First of all, here's why I think agriculture is the best place to be. It was October of 2015. I'd been a CEO, as Ambassador Quinn mentioned, of a company outside of agriculture for a while. And my wife and I were on a trip to Africa. We went to Tanzania with an NGO that we've supported for years called World Vision to see the work that they're doing on the ground. We landed in Kilimanjaro, but then went hundreds of miles away from any city to a small town they called Makindube. It was hot, humid, muddy, with lots of mosquitoes, and there wasn't a Marriott anywhere to be found. <laughs> but we quickly went out to a farming area and saw beautiful fields and welcoming smiles. A Tanzanian World Vision employee introduced us to a group of farmers, including a man by the name of Jonathan, who had, with great emotion, Jonathan told us about how five years before, they had grown very little rice, could hardly feed their families because it was so low yield and so low quality, and they felt helpless. In dry years, they couldn't even feed their families. They lived in mud huts, and their kids couldn't even go to school. But with the right support from World Vision and others, they had built irrigation ditches, were able to get the right seeds, fertilizers, and crop protection products, and were taught how to use them properly and safely. And now they are growing enough to feed their entire community and sell to the market to earn money 
and are now living in a brick home, and he's sending his kids to school and buying up additional farmland to cultivate. We also met a woman named Mary who had been an outcast that nobody would talk to. But now she's a successful farmer on her feet, taking care of her child, and she was feeding us in her brick home. And we met other farmers with similar heartwarming stories. On the way back from that trip on the plane, I told my wife that deep in my gut, I really missed the joy of being part of agriculture. Six weeks later, I got a call asking if I was interested in the Syngenta CEO role. Well, I jumped for joy. And fortunately, my wife was just as happy even though we had to move. And now for the last year and a half, I've been thankful every day for the blessing to be back in agriculture and working with all of you to try and make a difference. Now here, as we gather in Des Moines, surrounded by thriving fields that stretch as far as the eye can see, it can be hard to think about food shortages that still plague other parts of the world that many of you are familiar with. And the original Green Revolution saved an India on the brink of starvation and other countries, but at the same time, much of that revolution bypassed too much of Africa. Enter Dr. Adeshima. He has reached out to smallholders, offering greater access to agriculture technologies needed for their success so that they, their communities, their nations, and their continent can start to feed themselves. And today we gather to honor his accomplishments and together focus on what more needs to be done and how we can do it. And in the past, Syngenta leaders have addressed this gathering, offering our ideas to the conversation. For example, we've spoken about the relationship between food security and national security. We talked about how if people can't count on having enough food, and if the price of food suddenly becomes too expensive for them to afford, the result can be social unrest and violence. Another time, we outlined Syngenta's good growth plan, our commitment to improving resource efficiency, reviving ecosystems, and revitalizing rural communities to reduce poverty. We started this effort in 2013 by setting ambitious and measurable goals in six key areas that we want to achieve by 2020. One of these, by the way, is serving 20 million smallholder farmers every year in the developing world. We announced our goals to the world, and we checked our performance through independent auditors using a network of reference farms across crops and regions. And you can see all of the data on the Syngenta website. And also, the Syngenta Foundation for Sustainable Agriculture has participated in many World Food Prize activities over the years. They are working in developing countries with NGOs to help millions of pre-commercial smallholder farmers access badly needed farming technologies, training, insurance, financing, and connecting them to markets, helping them to become sustainable. And today, we continue offering our support both in our words and our deeds. More than four years ago, Syngenta entered into its first memorandum of understanding with USAID to help transform smallholder African agriculture. Earlier today, Ambassador Mark Green, who's the administrator of USAID, said in his keynote that USAID would provide a $2 million grant to the Syngenta Foundation for a partnership in collaboration with the African Agricultural Technology Foundation to help smallholder farmers in five African countries access affordable, high-yielding seeds through local businesses. We're also talking to USAID about supporting several African nations to combat the fall armyworm, which has been eating away through its way through fields of young corn and other crops. This horrific pest 
has already destroyed more than 740,000 acres of corn, which many of you know is the staple food for over 200 million Africans. Today, I also signed an MOU with Ambassador Green that provides a framework for continued collaboration between USAID and Syngenta. And it outlines our intent to pursue shared objectives to empower farmers in Africa, Asia, and Latin America by delivering better technologies to smallholders and connecting them to markets. Now, public-private partnerships are key collaborations and Syngenta supports these efforts wherever they make sense. In late May of this year, we joined more than 220 other business leaders from across the United States to urge Secretary of State Tillerson to support strong funding for the State Department and USAID because of the critical role they play in these partnerships. Syngenta has a number of such partnerships, and one example is that we're working closely with the Innovative Vector Control Consortium and the Gates Foundation to bring our advanced mosquito control technology to Africa. And this is helping save thousands of lives every year and helping farmers stay healthy so they can focus on growing their crops. Now these are exciting times as we have entered a new era of innovation in agriculture. One that allows us to develop innovative products and services faster, more cost effectively, and with less impact on the environment to meet the needs of both farmers and consumers. Let me explain. Many companies, including Syngenta, breed seeds for the world's major row crops and vegetables, and that work has always been done by experienced breeders who painstakingly toil in the fields to identify varieties with better, more desirable characteristics and traits. But now, scientists in labs and at computers support these breeders with new biotechnologies and data science techniques to achieve more precise outcomes in less time. Statistics and data analytics have begun, become increasingly able to unlock a plant's full potential. Data algorithms, together with advanced molecular markers, enable virtual trialing, so breeders can analyze potential genetic combinations before planting trials accelerating genetic grains very greatly. And data analytics are also becoming increasingly important for farmers. So not only great products for farmers, but how farmers farm. Sophisticated algorithms give our seed advisors, for example, insights into each farmer's unique needs, taking into account their soil conditions, their growing history, their seed performance, the expected weather conditions, and other factors so that we can help the farmers improve their seed selection and their crop protection approach. And we bring all this together for farmers in a digital whole farm management system that helps them apply just the right amount of nutrients, water, and crop protection to sustainably maximize yields. And now we're starting to see that farmers are increasingly allowing food companies to tap into this database so that the food companies can assure they're sourcing grain from sustainable farms. And that adds value. Now with all this focus on data, analytics, and algorithms, in addition to continuing to employ and hire skilled breeders, we're also hiring a lot of mathematicians, data scientists, and biotechnology experts, and they all work together to help farmers. Genome editing, which we may have to find a better name for, <laughs> is another exciting new precise breeding tool that's helping step change the way we develop seeds. We can now do by choice what nature has only been able to do by chance, and we do it a lot faster. Now, these techniques offer great potential to humanity if regulatory policy keeps pace. Plant breeding has a long and safe track record. Let's make sure the regulatory process keeps up and enables these products 
to get to market when they're proven safe. We're also creating exciting innovation in crop protection products that work with seed genetics and traits to increase yields. New advances in insecticides, herbicides, and fungicides are helping farmers better deal with the enemies of their crops. The latest products, like our adepidin fungicide, are much more targeted and have less unintended consequences. And we're developing more biological-based crop protection products. One of these uses a naturally occurring soil bacterium to keep nematodes from feeding and reproducing, keeping plant roots safe, and increasing yields. So the new era of innovation agriculture is upon us. Does it sound futuristic? It is the future for sure, but that future is already here in the US, and we can advance throughout the rest of the world with these technologies. Now, I'm sure everyone in this room is familiar with skeptics who don't accept the need for technology in agriculture and even consider it a threat. And some think the answer is to go all organic, which they often believe does not use pesticides. Even some organic food retailers and some big ones claim the foods that they sell pr are produced without the use of pesticides. These claims are not accurate, and experts are beginning to call them out on it. But consumers are being misled, and the problem is getting bigger. Organic foods, as you know, are not more nutritious, and with lower yields, organic often requires more land and water and emits more greenhouse gases per unit of food production. And the pesticides used often require more volumes to be effective, and there is often use of heavy metal copper used as an organic fungicide. Organic is a great marketing success, and consumers pay high prices for the image. This is great for our margins as well, because we sell a lot of pesticides to the, and seeds to the organic market. <laughs> but I am concerned about the environmental impact potential if organic grows much more beyond the 4% it represents today without the use of better technologies. Now, the ability to feed another 2 billion people in the coming decades in a sustainable way is only possible if we have the freedom to operate with safe technologies. This is why we must have an open dialogue about what sustainability really is and clear up misconceptions. Now, as you may have heard, Syngenta was recently acquired by a company in China who takes the long view and wants us to continue to develop and bring sustainable technologies to the world to help ensure that there is always going to be enough food for everybody on the planet, including the 1.4 billion Chinese people. They understand, with the US being our largest market, that we look to help build bridges between this, the greatest agriculture producing country in the world, and China, the greatest agriculture consuming country in the world. And here in Iowa and across the United States, we will continue to support U.S. farmers and the good paying jobs our industry creates here. We have been and continue to expand our operations in the United States because this is where our global seeds business is and much of our crop protection operations are, and it's where we are based to serve the U.S. farmer and to take that support to our capabilities around the world. In addition to doing more here in the U.S. and around the world to better support farmers, we will do more to help farmers in China not only improve their yields to better support the Chinese agriculture, but also to help address the large environmental challenges that the Chinese government is greatly concerned and the Chinese people are greatly concerned about. So obviously, to provide food security for more than 9 billion people, we need governments, NGOs, educational institutions, researchers, farmers, and our competitor innovators all in this together, everybody in this room. And we will accomplish much more through collaboration 
and friendly competition. That is why we are all here. Now, the innovative spirit of Dr. Borlaug saved over a billion lives. And now Dr. Adeshna is advancing that call in Africa, where innovation is needed most of all to help Africa meet its dream of becoming a country that can feed itself and no one goes hungry. I am optimistic that we together will get there and prove worthy of this great challenge. And you can count on Syngenta to continue to do its part. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wow, wasn't that great? Let's have another round of applause for Eric Fearwald. You know, just, uh, yeah. So, Eric, just to say one thing is here, his office is in Basel, in Europe. His company now is owned in China. And I take a lot of heart in the fact that it's somebody from Des Moines who's in the middle of that and bringing it all together to focus it to Africa. That is the new world of agriculture, agribusiness, and seed industry. So, so glad that you're there. Thank you for being with us today. So now I want to invite our next panel up. This was, uh, got everybody going and that, and now follow up with uh, a, uh, CEO panel of uh, remarkable diversity, accomplishment, and leadership. And uh, let me invite a panel to come to the stage. And that with uh, Paul Schickler, the uh, past president of DuPont Pioneer, is going to be our moderator. This and uh, invite uh, Tim Hassinger and R.J. Kirk. Tom Hayes and Jim Blom to come up here <clears throat> for a panel on consolidation, innovation, and the road to feeding 9 billion by 2050. I don't think we've ever had an assemblage like this before, the World Food Prize on the stage at the same time. Thank you so much for being here. Paul, over to you. Okay. And thank you, Ken, and thank you to the World Food Prize for bringing this together. I think as Ken said, it is a pretty remarkable uh, topic, but also a remarkable set of panelists that uh, we have to join us to address this topic. And just to remind you, the topic is consolidation, innovation, and feeding 9 billion people by the year 2050. Um, I'm not going to introduce uh, individually the panel members. You can read about their bios. Um, in the material that is part of the agenda and the World F Food Prize material. But we do have uh, Tim Hassinger. Um, Tim is currently CEO of Lindsay Corporation, four days. Uh, <laughs> prior to that, a uh, long career with Dow AgriSciences. And then Tim Hayes, uh, excuse me, uh, Tom Hayes with Tyson Foods. Um, Jim Bloom, Bayer Crop Science. And then RJ Kirk from Intrexon. And the reason um, I'm excited about not only the topic here, uh, but also the panel members, when you look at the challenges that we face for 9 billion people and the topic of this uh, panel um, subject, consolidation and innovation, look at the four companies or pieces, sectors of the industry that are represented. You have water. People are concerned about water availability and quality. You have uh, meat, poultry, uh, and a great supplier of protein that the demand um, is increasing and will only increase as we look to the future. You have uh, seed technology and crop protection materials uh, that are necessary to lift the productivity uh, from where it is today around the world for the future. And then finally, research and innovation, particularly focused on synthetic biology, key to the future of bringing science to agriculture and food production. So really uh, a great representation across uh, what I would say not only the most interesting topics that we face, but in some cases, the most controversial topics that we face. 
So the format here is where I'm going to have uh, each of the four, starting on my left, and we'll just move straight uh, that way, uh, address um, with comments about five minutes the question of, from your experience, we've got great experience here among the panel, what are the trend lines or the most significant developments in your part of the food and agricultural business world, and what do you see are the greatest challenges? Sure. Tim. Well, let me take a shot here. Uh, let me address a few trends that I see and then uh, a few comments around what I think is really critical for us going forward. You, a topic that's talk, been talked about throughout the entire day is the need to increase food production. And, of course, a key factor of that is it's estimated about 70% of that needed gain is going to come from new innovation. And I just speak for the industry that I'm representing up here is if we look at irrigation today, 16% of the arable land is irrigated, but that particular land generates 44% of the total agricultural output. So an area of need from innovation is making sure that the efficiency of that irrigation allows relative to the water supply that we have that that can continue because of the great need. That's just one example of the need for innovation. Consolidation is another trend that we're seeing, and obviously that's getting a lot of press related to, uh, uh, to the industry. And if we look at drivers behind that, we've seen significant farmer consolidation. We've seen, especially in the highly regulated areas of agriculture, an increase in cost, and in many cases, even more importantly, an increase in timeline from invention to commercialization. While you put couple that with a drive for productivity in what could be described as a difficult ag market, as a result, we're seeing an increase in consolidation. Consumers is an area I really want to hit, and this is an area that we've seen a, a significant trend. I can probably best describe this by a, a study that I saw from the, the Center of uh, Food Integrity. And if you look at an annual survey that they do, and it's all about what is your, what do you see as one of the most pressing needs that you have? What could be unemployment, could be healthcare, et cetera. Two of the top four responses were food, around the area of affordability and around the area of health. So it is clearly on consumers' minds about the food and how critical that is in terms of pressing needs from their side. A second question I thought was concerning that we need to get out on the table is, do you see the food industry moving in a positive direction or the wrong direction? The right direction or the wrong direction? And 60% said wrong direction or not sure. So the confidence piece is obviously critical, which leads to what I would say is the last trend that I highlight, highlight here is at a time when we're seeing science rapidly evolve and improve and expand, we're seeing the trust in science go down or the credibility of the science decrease. So we've got capability going up, but trust coming down. So, Paul, I would I'd summarize this by saying you know, three, three things really jump out at me as what can we do? One, the need to connect with the consumer has is, is never been higher, which is really the part of listening and then the second part of that is making sure that we can frame and tell our story and, and really encouraging all of us as input suppliers on the agribusiness side to really think like a food company in terms of understanding what our end user, end consumer is, I think is, is really critical. The other one I would say is the need for alliance with, uh, if we can put in quotation, kind of the, uh, the unconventional uh, organizations or partnerships. I think of the Affordable Food Act, which many people in Congress have described as what was probably the most contentious bill to ever go through the U.S. congressional system, that had over 1,100 different organizations supporting that positions. Of course, with many of them for different reasons, but the need to find alliances and bring that through. And the last comment I'll leave you with here is, I think it's important that we broad, broaden the term science. We've been as ag, an industry that has focused and really valued technical science, and we're now at a time where digital science and social science has now become every bit as important as the technical science side. So those are some areas that I would encourage us to think about in terms of going forward.
Good, Tim. Thanks for that overview. Um, you spoke to a couple of points, uh, you know, regarding co consolidation and consumers, and we'll probably come back to those later. <laughs> Tom, please. Sure. Well, uh, hey, thanks for having us here. Uh, to begin with, Tyson Foods is a really proud member of the Iowa community. We have about 10,000 team members that are in Iowa, uh, eight production facilities. And, uh, you know, like Tim said, we you know, do want to talk about the consumer. You're going to find, you know, for Tyson, we span from agriculture, so we're, you know, part of agribusiness for sure. We're also all the way to dining culture. We're doing a lot as it relates to our brands. We've got some wonderful billion dollar brands, you know, with Tyson and Jimmy Dean and Hillshire. Those are all under the Tyson Foods umbrella, if you didn't know. And, you know, to uh, spare you the suspense, uh, for those of you that were at lunch, the issues that we have are, you know, obviously feeding the world. But I think Raj, if, I don't know if he's in here or not, he hit it. Uh, on the head, I think brilliantly, that uh, we got to have a combined sustainable approach to feeding the world for sure, and it's not easy. And so that's uh, sort of the, you know, the thing that I think is a challenge for us. The opportunity is, for sure, we want to have a nutrient-dense diet for everybody around the world, and it doesn't get done by you know, just one person doing it or one company doing it. We have to be cooperative. We have to do this in a total you know, system effort. So at Tyson, what we're focused on is protein. We're a protein company and we're really excited about, you know, making sure uh, consumers are excited about the protein that we serve. Uh, we are in the animal harvesting business, but I would say also we're equally focused on what's the next leg of the journey. We have a company stood up called uh, Tyson Ventures, Tyson New Ventures. It's a fund that we're investing on companies that are either in plants, protein, uh, could be any sort of new technology on that front. Also waste, taking food waste out, a lot of that has been talked about today. And so our focus is on making sure protein is delivered effectively, efficiently. It's got to taste good, you know, if you're going to serve the consumer, uh, particularly here in the U.S. And, you know, make sure that we are having a big part of that dialogue. You know, we think that big companies need to be a part of this discussion. It's not going to happen alone with backyard farms. You know, Tyson needs to get in the game, and we're really excited about that. So what I'll say about how we do that and becoming more sustainable is uh, I've been the CEO of the company uh, since the beginning of January, president for a bit over a year, and we have uh, made the move to actually change what our purpose is as a company. And so our purpose is to raise the expectations of the good that food can do. And that means having a very proactive approach to sustainability versus a def defensive approach against uh, sort of NGOs and working you know, more cooperatively with those that take a holistic view to sustainability. Uh, we have hired, I have hired a uh, sustainability leader, Justin Whitmore. He's our chief sustainability and strategy officer. And he is focused on trying to work with you know, the best NGOs that are going to uh, want to be cooperative with us and try to understand that we don't do everything right every day of the week, and we have history where we haven't done things absolutely right. But that, you know, what matters is what we do going forward and how we change, you know, the world for the better. And so what, for us, it's not solving one particular issue, whether it's animal welfare or environment or, you know, worker safety. It's doing things all together because we have to have, you know, the ability to lift all boats. It's a holistic approach to sustainability. So then the last you know, thing that I'll just mention is, you know, uh, this is, for my purposes, the first time I've been you know, to something that is uh, as broad as this as it relates to the agribusiness area, uh, because I'm generally attending consumer conferences, and my background is more consumer. And uh, just sitting here over you know, this, uh, listening to the dialogue today, it's incredible you know, the amount of talent that is not just in this room, but you know, is represented by the organizations you're a part of and the companies that you work for. And I think uh, we can do anything. I mean, it certainly is a tall task to be able to drive forward with a sustainable food system for everybody. But I have uh, full confidence that we can do it if we work together. And I'm very proud to be here. And thank you for the opportunity. Thanks, Tom. Jim, please. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Paul, I want to thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'm an Iowa farm boy, a chance to come back to Iowa and be here on a beautiful harvest afternoon and 
You know, not far from here, the beautiful number two corn is spiraling up that combine and making a spectacular yellow splash into that grain wagon and heading off to feed the world, right? And that's what we're here about. You know, I can almost smell the corn dust, you know, it just takes me back. And anybody who's done that knows exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, appreciate the invitation. Your question, uh, you know, it, it, what's our biggest challenge at Bear? Uh, as you know, we're in the middle of our acquisition of Monsanto and doing a lot of things. I got this invitation just a little bit late. Our global CEO needed to go on a different business. If you've seen our press releases the last couple of weeks, you know what, what, what we're up to and what we've been up to. But as we pursue our quest to feed nine or 10 billion people in the next very early uh, stages of this century, and probably with less land and maybe with less water, it's really an important core question for us what our biggest challenge is. We have the know-how, uh, we have the resources, so it comes down to that key thing that's your challenge. And for us, it's the disconnect. It's the disconnect between the industrialized nations who have plenty of food versus the rest of the world who sometimes have a food security issue, right? And that, and that, and, and that is, in, in a nutshell, our issue on the disconnect. With industrial nations, we're starting to talk about sustainable farming, and I'm excited by seeing that term, and, and I see it as, a, as an icon to remind us that are associated with agriculture that a lot of people haven't. When I see that or people bring that up in conversations with me, it reminds me that I need to stop, take time, and educate these people on what farmers do. Farmers have been doing a fantastic job of growing over the years. We, there's just fewer of us. We need to take the time to, to share that story. And I can't think of a more sustainable farmer than a sixth generation farmer working with the seventh generation and, and making great decisions every day to hand that land off uh, to him. We also see um, societal acceptance, right? So societal acceptance of the farming community is limited. And societal acceptance of new innovation technology in the food industry is sometimes very low. So we have to address that. Uh, I often see the paradox of young people today. And the paradox is that these people will stand, these young people, I love them to death, will stand in line overnight and for blocks long lines to get the latest iPhone technology. They carry it with them, they'll hold it next to their body. It's fantastic, there are adoption curves in that industry that I'm envious of, right? But the paradox is that same young person might uh, actually prefer his food to be grown with a pair of mules. And that's where the story's breaking down. That's where we're not telling our story well enough and we need to uh, start doing something about it. At Bear, we know that acceptance in our home markets won't help us solve world hungry. It's really getting that message out and getting that acceptance out to allow us to take advantage of technology to feed the world in the future. It's all about shared objectives. It's all about educating people on the shared objectives. We do it through our industry, through great associations like CropLife or bio or U.S. Uh, farming and ranching alliances and a lot of the commodity groups and a lot of the people I've seen here at this group do a great job of sharing that shared objective of going forward. We also need to do that with academia and also with the consumer groups. And that shared objective is that technology acceptance will feed the world. It's a very simple uh, tool. I spend a lot of time and on my boards doing just that, trying to improve consumer acceptance of technology. So we have the know-how, we have the resources, and I think today's event really underlines the common commitment to the goal of educating the world that we need to accept technology going forward. It is the answer, and it will help us feed the world. Thank you, Paul. Okay, Jim, thanks. Now we'll conclude the opening remarks with a look to innovation and research. Uh, RJ, please. Thanks, Paul. Uh, so first, thanks for having me. I'm lost in thought based on, <laughs> based on what each of you said. Uh, so I'd just like to make a couple of observations. <clears throat> uh, you know, the first being, uh, I'm struck by, because you guys are big incumbent food companies and we're just a tiny 
innovator company with only 1,000 employees. And, and we have some interesting projects going on in food and some interesting uh, technologies. And I know some, I think all of you are aware of them. But uh, I just want to mention that, you know, in terms of trend line, right, clearly all three of you represent, well, you represent a genetics business. And that's how you became the great, really the great industry. And we were talking about the, the benefits that Tyson, you know, brought to the world through improved efficiency in the broiler. That started out with genetics, right? Uh, and then you are in the process of buying, I don't mind telling you this, I've told Rob Fraley this, uh, I sometimes have to correct our own people. They'll tell me that we are the leading synthetic biology company on the planet. That's not actually true. The leading and best synthetic biology company on the planet is Monsanto, and thank God they decided to focus exclusively on row crops or we wouldn't have as much opportunity as we do. So, so you are a technology business. You've always been a technology business, uh, Dow, and, and Paul, you've been heading a technology business for <laughs> quite a while. Uh, and by that, what I mean is biotechnology. So what's frequently lost in this discussion is we talk about the food industry, and it's because you guys are incumbents, so you have to refer to it as, you know, through the in incumbent terminology, nomenclature, right, food. But it's not really food. Uh, at, at your core and your, you know, the tools you use and the approaches you use and so forth, you are biotechnology businesses. That really shouldn't be surprising because here's to get back to how we educate the public. I've been, I've been doing this, you all do this as well. Uh, what we really need to educate people about is that food is the original biotechnology industry. That the civilization was founded 12,000 years ago. What we refer to as civilization was actually founded on a biotechnology, right? It's that we could breed cereal grains initially, and we could breed those animals to, you know, to effect. Um, and the world that the kids you were referring to uh, imagine, of, they imagine is the, the world of maybe, I don't know, 100 years, you said mules, right? So 100 years ago, right? As being some sort of pristine natural world that was unaltered by man. That's just craziness. That's not true. Uh, man's footprint on this planet has been enormous. We have radically modified this planet, and we've been at it for 12,000 years. So the one thing we could do to help the public get educated is stop buying into this pretense that, um, that we now have a decision to make. Like, should we, should we be altering nature? Are you kidding me? Uh, you know, 12,000 years ago, the amount of vertebrate biomass on this planet was about 200 million tons, right? They were called wild animals, right? Uh, now the Homo sapiens biomass is greater than that. The bovine biomass is a billion, <laughs> it's a billion tons. Um, so, you know, uh, global warming, I mean, you look at, when you look at, uh, you know, core samples from the, you know, from glaciers in the Arctic, I mean, we see that that's when it really got going. Of course, that just happens to be right after the last ice age, so who knows the, who knows the cause? But, but the point is, we have been busy as genetic engineers for 12,000 years, and agriculture is a part of that. It's not that there's this new technology we're suddenly applying to uh, agriculture. It's just the opposite. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here because this is the, this is the origin, this is the Mecca, uh, this is the Garden of Eden of, the, of man's original technology. And so, here's the good news. So what I'm encouraged by the fact that this worry that we all have, this anxiety we all have is about uh, as to whether we can feed nine billion people and uh, that will be here in a couple decades. Um, you know, that's been an anxiety of every generation of man since the Reverend Thomas Malthus. And when you, look at, when you look at the prediction that each one of those generations made, including Malthus, they were always 100% correct based on the assumptions that they were making. But they were historically 100% wrong. And they were historically 100% wrong because technology improved our efficiencies, improved our capabilities. So what we are talking, the application of technology to this issue is, as we all know this, and you know, it's not optional. It is absolutely mandatory if we're gonna meet this challenge. I'm heartened to think that it is, and just to, so to answer the question, Paul, directly, I see um, plenty of room for um, encouragement around the world, uh, among regulators, among, in the media, 
Uh, there are all, you know, look, there have been, there've been people hysterical about vaccines for 200 years. So it's not like you're, you, we can expect to win everyone over. But in general, when I think about, look, we, you know, our, um, our mosquito, the jurisdiction of our mosquito was just transferred from FDA to EPA, which is where it belongs. Uh, we, our talks with EPA are, I think, extremely constructive. Um, uh, our Arctic apple, I think, uh, tests out as being probably the most consumer preferred GMO food item in all of history. Uh, so, you know, we're really encouraged about that. I'm not here to make an advertisement, but all I'm saying is I'm encouraged by the things that I see. I'm encouraged by the fact that society is beginning to appreciate um, uh, the technologies that, uh, that, 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 we're, that are central to our lives and our, our businesses. Uh, and I think, I, I'll just say, I'm, I'm very encouraged. I think we're going to see a, a bright future, and I think we're going to meet this challenge. Good. RJ, thanks. Uh, you said a lot there. And, um, uh, you know, a couple of the points that you made on uh, consumer um, impact or consumer thoughts and global modification, we're going to come to those. And uh, I'm going to start with Tim and Tom, so I'll give you a little uh, heads up on the consumer issue. Um, RJ, you used the words I think you said, um, uh, we got to get real with this. Um, and that means consumers, be open and honest with consumers. Tim, you mentioned that we need to increase the consumer dialogue. And Tom, you've got brands that end up right in front of consumers. So I'd like the two of you to speak to how do we engage consumers in science that is designed to improve productivity and improve food and help nutrition when there's at least um, four of us on stage here that are pretty removed from the consumer. Production agriculture is not real close to the end consumer. But on the other hand, Tom is. So Tim, I'd like you to first respond to that. How do we engage in the consumer better than we have in the past when our distance is so far from the consumer, but yet these issues are right at the forefront of their interests? I think the first thing is, over the last few years, the level of engagement on this topic has increased a lot. That in itself has been positive. But Paul, I would say that the emphasis in most sessions that I go to is on how we can be more effective on the tell but I don't hear a lot of comments around how we could be more effective on the listen. And we use a lot of terms that if you're not in this industry, and we've heard just a couple even this afternoon, whether it's GMO, gene editing, et cetera, in the absence of knowledge, those are kind of scary comment, thoughts. Those are scary terms. And I think what it leads to is if listening's critical, then we've got to find forums where we can listen and to me, that's critical. And I'll just give you one example that I've seen and the benefit of is, uh, and I'll just use leadership on, a, on, on companies that are in agribusiness, making sure that leadership is in X number of forums where you're talking, in, uh, presenting, or you're at least in the uh, dialogue of a group that doesn't agree with you and your industry, I think is very helpful for us going forward. So Tom, what advice would you give to those novices here in production agriculture that don't connect directly to the consumer? I'm not sure, if, I'm not sure I've seen any novice here, to be clear. <laughs> Everybody seems like they're experts. Um, you know, what, what I would say is consumers want transparency and they want authenticity and that's what we've you know, certainly seen. Uh, there is a difference. I think um, probably older consumers are a little more um, understanding of what happens on the farm and probably younger consumers are a, little, you know, a bit more removed. And so not necessarily understanding you know, what happens day in and day out, how difficult it is, puts the onus on us as, I think, manufacturers in the industry to share you know, what we do and be really transparent about it and own it when we have issues. I think that's, a, that's the first thing. The second thing is, well, how do you do that? You know, and for us, we've done some things like uh, Facebook Live on the farm. We went to a uh, chicken, chicken house and showed actually what happens. Um, we've done things that are continuously sort of trying to bring out what are the good you know, things that happen within our whole supply chain. And, and that's, not always, that's not always easy. So I'd say that's, that's uh, really important. And overall, I think people just want to make sure that their food is clean, authentic, 
healthy. I mean, they, are, they just want the same thing that everybody else wants. And I think it really starts with a level of transparency. And quite frankly, I don't know as an industry that we've really been there. So it's not, I don't think it's necessarily unjustified. I think we can do better. Okay, good. Thanks. Um, and I'm going to connect this sort of consumer um, point with the science that is in front of us. And even uh, in the session before, uh, we, hear, we heard Eric Fearwall talk about uh, uh, gene editing and our opportunity to position it differently than uh, transgenic uh, biotechnology. So now I'm going to look to Jim and RJ to maybe speak to that. Uh, we've got an opportunity here with a new science, uh, gene editing, to um, uh, deliver that science in a different way than maybe what we've done over the last uh, 20 years. So, Jim, how should we go about doing that? Yep, no, it's an exciting opportunity for us to start on a, on a front foot that says what it is. It's different, we're not adding anything to it, it's editing, and it may have a different regulatory path. The language, the paths, how we address that could be a, a, a wonderful differentiation for a faster adoption curve on, on that side, and we're excited about that. RJ, you want to get real with uh, our message. Sure. How, do you, how do you get real about gene editing? <clears throat> yeah, so first of all, uh, I'm one of, the, one of the, I'm the odd man out in probably biotechnology who is looking at gene editing as distinct from gene engineering, right? Uh, I understand why everybody else is excited about it because it looks like an end around you know, existing regulatory structure. I'm not in favor of that generally. I'm just in favor of science-based uh, regulations. Uh, I do think that new creations that are brought to market should be subject to regulatory review. I think their safety uh, and utility should be investigated. Uh, but, but once that is done, right, they should be judged on their merits and not based on phobia, technophobia, as I spoke about last year. Um, so, so just gene engineering generally, uh, look, it's... Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's not optional. <laughs> it's absolutely mandatory. And, but in terms of connecting that to the consumer, let me give an example. I, I, I don't mean to sound you know, uh, too uh, mercenary, but I want to give an example from, from our por for portfolio. So one of our assets, uh, it was, we own the majority of a, a company called uh, Aqua Bounty, which uh, after 20 years of effort obtained uh, FDA approval. Uh, and Health Canada approval of the world's first genetically modified food animal. So this is an Atlantic salmon that comes to market weight uh, in one half the time and on about 30% less food. Uh, so basically, as we were discussing earlier, it's basically we domesticated the salmon uh, and, and we did it uh, using molecular biology. It has a tiny bit of code um, that is not native to the salmon. It was actually introduced from other edible um, uh, fish. Uh, other fish that are consumed by man in order to uh, obtain that uh, better growth trajectory and better feed conversion ratio and, um, and so forth. So how, do you, how can you engage people on this? Well, I think you can, first of all, educate them about the salmon they're eating today. So the first thing that I would, and just, just to show them what the options are, and then it's back to your point, is like, how do you work your asset, right? How do you deploy your asset in the best way and in the way that will most uh, logically uh, fit with consumers? So our idea on this is, that, is to realize that this is an environmental benefit. So first of all, if you want to talk about fish, you should rec immediately recognize that marine extraction is the least sustainable food uh, production technology on the planet. Um, it, it just can't, you know, we're all, we've, we've cut in half the number of fish in the sea over the last quarter of a century. Uh, the forecasts are pretty dire. <laughs> we can't continue to do that. Um, so 95% of the salmon, uh, you want to talk about food security, 95% of the salmon consumed in the United States is imported chiefly from sea cages in Norway and Chile. So you, you, you've got some cages in the sea, you put your smolt in there, you dump food on it, right? So that means all the indigenous marine organisms bring every pathogen that they have to your, to your crop. Um, the mortality rates recently in these sea cages have been around 50%. Uh, for our scientists to build a library of sea lice, uh, they had to do nothing more than go to the supermarket. Um, our idea is to grow these fish on land so we can grow them here in Des Moines, all right? And we can grow them in Omaha, we can grow them anywhere, right? Grow them on land in controlled environments uh, so they will be antibiotic free, they'll be uh, vaccine free, they will be pathogen free because we'll be able to con control them. And use this 
production advantage to confer a consumer advantage. And I think, I think we're going to come to this, in a few minutes, if I remember rightly, but uh, I think this is what consumers are looking for today, like more, you know, more responsible uh, production, more sustainable uh, food production, and something that aligns more with their interests. You know, just going back to our agriculture being the original biotechnology, we should remember that the lines between, uh, actually it was the theme of last year's conference here, if you recall, the lines between food and health and environment are if they exist at all, you know, they're, they're very porous and very gray. Um, so I think we, we're, we're all in those businesses too, and, and I think if we think about our technologies and the deployment of our assets in this way, we'll find ways of connecting. Yeah, good. Um, it's great to be the, uh, the panel moderator. I can take a little uh, editorial license here and uh, just make a strong statement that if we do position gene editing as an end around of uh, regulatory systems, it will be the failure of gene editing as a technology. So, my editorial license. Um, again, remembering the topic here, uh, and the topic of the agenda did in include consolidation. Um, so I wanna shift a little bit and talk about consolidation as it relates to research. You know, one of the fears Yes, you've got anti-competitive issues as it relates to potential uh, consolidation, but one of the fears also is that innovation or research will be diminished. So, uh, Jim, I'd like you to speak to what, what you see, you know, as you go through a consolidation activity, um, what the opportunities are around for research and uh, whatever the limitations or opportunities there are for research. Sure. We're you know, our, our excitement around this is, is to build a company that can be an innovation leader in, in several areas, but at the same time maintain competition within the film and at the farm and at the farm gate. So you saw us talking about future innovations where we're putting uh, gene trait research right alongside chemical research, research at the same time to take advantage or to be an anti antidote to longer uh, regulatory periods and more expensive regulatory periods. It's been a bit of a difficult time for us. You also saw us be very diligent about making sure through the regulatory process that works very well in, in, in the world to make sure that we provide the data to the regulatory authorities, explain it to them in detail and make sure that they have complete understanding to make their decisions. As a result, you saw a press release from us last week uh, creating a new global seed company in BASF. Uh, as a result of our ac actions to try to in, in acquire Monsanto and build a new bear crop science business. So I think both of them are very important. I think uh, we want to look at transformative innovation in agriculture. There's lots of room to do that. It's going to take a stepped up, increased, different look at research and development, and that's what we're doing at Bear is to create that kind of an, a company to do that. And Tom, I'm gonna to ask you the same question because um, you're in a little different situation where livestock and poultry have not only consolidated a bit at the um, uh, industry players level, but also vertically uh, in, the, in those sectors as well. So what has consolidation done to your ability to increase innovation in livestock and poultry? Yeah, I guess I'd start from, I'm a pure capitalist. <laughs> so I think that, you know, that innovation is always going to be there to the extent that, you know, companies consolidate and they become too big and they sort of fall on their own weight. That's, a, that's an issue, right? So you have companies that will continue to try to get as much scale as they possibly can. And what ends up happening is it becomes bureaucratic. There has, uh, there's a lot of, you know, things that get in the way of innovation. What I would say is sort of um, fixes itself. What we have done, I'll go back to the, what I talked about, the Tyson Ventures. It's a private equity, almost part of our business, a separate fund that seeks out small companies, entrepreneurs that are innovating and doing things that we probably aren't even thinking of, certainly aren't thinking of, and trying to seed them you know, with investment in order to become bigger. Uh, consolidation, I think, is good in certain areas. <clears throat> Certainly not good if it's going to harm the consumer. We understand that fully, and we don't want to do that. But I think in some areas, consolidation actually really helps. I mean, if a company can be, you know, that much stronger and be a better citizen at the same time, I would, you know, fully vote for it. 
where I think the, uh, the rub comes is, you know, staying on that innervation curve while becoming big, and that's not always easy. And so that would be my two cents on, the, on innovation. Um, and lastly, RJ, you'd, if you'd speak to it as well, I mean, you're a leader on the private side, but if you've, seen, if you've looked at research over the years, over the last number of decades, public research has declined, uh, private research has increased, there's concern about whether um, you know, that should or could uh, uh, continue. What's the role of public research in the challenges that we're facing as an industry? I think that the opportunities are, well, I think the opportunities are so vast uh, that it's almost, it almost doesn't matter um, how much public uh, money is spent on research because, you know, look, if you, if you look at any, any general scientific publication, peer-reviewed science or nature, for example, if you look in the employment ads in the back, I think it's about a 100% market share for our fields now. So, you know, cellular biology, systems biology, computational biology, molecular biology. That's, those, these, are the pe these are the people who, you know, who, who companies and, acad uh, and academia wants to hire. These are the people who, we, who are most in demand today. Uh, our company, I think our number one recruitment school is Caltech. So I think the amount of intellectual capital flowing into uh, biotechnology, and again, I think we're all biotechnologists here. We're just, if, if, if you get big and successful like you guys, you get to say you're in the food business. <laughs> but, but, and I'll look forward to that someday, so, um, hopefully. <laughs> but, uh, you know, so I don't, public versus private uh, funding, I don't think that's, um, I don't think that's a big issue. Um, I know in healthcare, you know, uh, the NIH is a huge funder uh, in the United States. Uh, but, but around the world, you know, I see most innovation is really coming through, Look, venture capital, put it this way, venture capital flows right now, uh, including into food, right, are really at an all-time high. So in, in terms in food technology and biotechnology in general and so forth, at an absolute all-time high, I believe. So uh, I, I, don't not, I don't think we suffer from funding. And by the way, capital is, capital usually, I'm a capitalist too, so one broad observation I'll make is it usually flows to wherever it can be productive, public or private. Uh, so I don't think this is a great concern. Okay, good. okay we've, we've talked a lot uh, through um, our comments so far about social issues, uh, whether they be environmental, consumer preference, uh, animal health uh, issues, and so on, um, water. And so, Tim, um, I'd like you to speak a little bit about uh, some of the social issues in your new role that you're going to be facing about water usage, whatever, agriculture and food consume 70%, of the world's um, fresh water. Um, but what you're going to be looking at is you address uh, water issues around the quality, usage, and um, uh, preservation of water. Sure. Well, I go back to the original comment. Hey, it's very critical. A key driver in this whole industry is, is the efficiency for irrigation, to what I said earlier, because it plays such a key part to get the ultimate output that we need from agriculture. So there's a lot of different innovations, and I'll just give you one example that I just had a, an experience already just uh, first week on the job working at Lindsay Corporation. Uh, last night, we had uh, a group of Lindsay customers uh, in Omaha to talk to them, and it was a forum where sitting around a table, just dinner, there was no presentation. This was just, what's on your mind? Let's talk about that. Now, like I said, I've only been in the company one week, but I can say, give a good guess, that if that meeting would have happened five years ago, the topics that would have dominated that discussion would have been around the product and the price. And instead, it was all around the digital offering to, to, to get ultimately to the most efficient use possible. And this is an area where Lindsay's invested a lot, has a good offering, a very competitive, and, and actually in many cases a leading offer around the need and the helping farmers on the efficiency of their use of water, because there's a tremendous macro need here. And I only see that increasing in importance going forward. So Paul, it's on us today, and I think it'll only increase going forward. Yeah. Tom, animal rights, animal welfare. Um, I think in, in my recollection, um, over the next 15 years, three billion people will move from lower levels of income into the middle class. 
that middle class, that three billion people will demand protein. The great protein source is meat. Uh, but there are those that uh, question whether the globe can afford uh, to provide that much protein through meat to those three billion consumers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So I, I would say that uh, it's a tough one because it's, I would, there's a lot of focus on, you know, should we be doing this a better way? And um, my way of thinking is absolutely, if there's a better way, we should be doing it. Um, but it has to be affordable. And so right now, I mean, there's uh, companies out there, Memphis Meats and others that are looking at, you know, cultured meats as a way to replicate um, all the nutritional value that um, an animal produces um, in terms of their meat. And I think it's a it's a interesting technology, and it's also you know right now just not affordable. So I think it's one thing to you know want to have the food supply. It's another thing. It, it's got to be you know absolutely affordable. So, uh, but that is completely separate from animal welfare issues in my mind. What we are striving to do is to have the animals have one bad day in their lives. And uh, along that curve, we want to be the right stewards of their lives and make sure that they are uh, well cared for. And we are a big system. We will get things wrong from time to time. Uh, when we do get it wrong, we want to make change for the better and to continue to you know, make sure that we're doing the best we can with the animals within our care. Um, but because it is such a massive uh, issue, to your point, uh, as economies become stronger, which we all want globally, certainly protein is the first thing, frankly, that ends up becoming uh, more popular in those, in those economies because it's nutritionally dense. So we want to do our part to make sure we're coming up the curve, looking at new technologies, and uh, we are focused on protein. It doesn't have to be from animals. We're focused on protein. Okay, we've got about five minutes left, um, and also in the agenda title was nine billion people. So I'd like to go right down the line and each of you maybe take a minute or so to just speak to what have your experiences been in your firms or in your careers about what you're doing to help agriculture or food development in those countries that need to lift their capability so that they can enjoy food security now and into the future. What have you done at the local level? So first I'm gonna start with Jim, then go to RJ. Sure, no, we have a division that looks specifically at smallholder farming and how we can use uh, automation and other packaging to help them be a profitable farmer so that they not only don't worry about going to bed at night hungry, but also that they can create a business that can can sustain and be a, a, a profitable farming uh, venture. So that's a, it important to us. Yeah. yeah, I think probably the most meaningful thing we're doing um, uh, in that line uh, is in crop protection. <clears throat> so we've had a lot of interest uh, here at this conference concerning a press release we had out a couple of days ago pertaining to uh, our self-limiting insect, uh, uh, which is the fall armyworm. Uh, so we've, we've been working on this for a while, and we just got permission from our partner to disclose it, uh, the identity. And the reason we got permission from our partner to disclose it a few days ago is because of, the, you know, this is actually wreaking havoc in Africa right now. So, uh, you know, unlike the Aedes aegypti mosquito that invaded the Americas from Africa, this one's done the reverse. So this one's gone from Florida to Africa uh, and is now just decimating the uh, the the uh, corn crop in Africa. I think the damage now is around 15 billion per year. And, uh, you know, a lot of these producers are, you know, are, these are family farmers. <laughs> um, and so we've seen actually uh, at this conference, even today, you know, meetings with, uh, meetings with government officials and, um, uh, and others who have uh, real stakes in the venture. Uh, and so we're, we're highly encouraged that we'll be able to help this situation. I think that's the most tangible thing we're doing today. I'm going to broaden your question just a little bit. I, I think one of the first things is I'll say internal, and then I want to go external. When I look at my own career, a meeting started in the company I was in with what the strategy is. And today, meetings start around this industry, around what the purpose is. And I think your question, in many ways, is what has brought us as a broader ag industry together towards ultimately a common purpose. I think that's really helped a lot in terms of bringing unity towards a direction and alignment. 
And when I think of uh, Lindsay specifically to, your question, to answer your question, a project just completed here recently in Africa, which is gonna allow that particular community to be able to grow crops that they couldn't grow before and increase production. So for them, a real breakthrough. Yeah, so two things. One is uh, we are predominantly a U.S. company. Uh, we do uh, export a lot of uh, food, uh, and we have operations around the world for sure. Uh, in the U.S., I would say it's more of a short-term effort. There's acute need. There's a lot of uh, food deserts, as people have spoke about, and certainly food insecurity is something we're very um, concerned about. So since the year 2000, we've donated uh, over 100 million pounds of food to um, needs that are in the U.S., and then beyond that, uh, globally, we are also very active. And there's one initiative that I think is important to know about, which is our one egg effort. I don't know how many people have heard of that, but it's uh, just starting with one egg. How do you expand poultry production in areas that haven't had it? Because chicken is a great way to feed people that need it. It's a nutrient dense food. And so we have the one egg effort uh, that's uh, been up and running in uh, Uganda, Rwanda, Haiti. And that's something that uh, we are getting behind. And we have a lot of our team members that are uh, extraordinarily excited about what that can do. OK, very good. Um, first, I'm going to uh, offer my thanks to each of you for uh, not only being here, but also the great contributions you've made to the discussion. Tim, Tom, Jim, and RJ, thank you very much. Uh, please um, uh, share your enthusiasm and appreciation for what they've contributed. Thank you very much. Folks, we'll uh, get ready for our last panel of the day now, if, if people could take their seats. Very good. So our last panel is going to discuss nutrition and the UN Sustainable Development Goals. I'll let you all get situated here. Folks, are we ready? Let's go. All right. Folks, here we go. We're going to talk about nutrition in the UN Sustainable Development Goals, specifically the role of agriculture in the U.S. dairy industry in fostering global economic development. We have a very distinguished panel today, and we're especially fortunate to have former U.S. Secretary of Agriculture Tom Vilsack moderating this panel. Secretary Vilsack is also the former governor of the great state of Iowa and a new member of the Council of Advisors for the World Food Prize. So I'd like to invite Secretary Vilsack and his panel to the podium here. Dr. Lee, thank you very, very much. And uh, it's nice to have you back in the state as you uh, provide great leadership to the University of Auburn. Uh, appreciate the role that you played in uh, taking Iowa State to the next level as well. So it's, uh, it's good to see you again. And thank you all for being here uh, this afternoon. Uh, I think this is an incredibly important panel. Uh, and I think it's, uh, we appreciate the fact that you are here at the end of a long day. Uh, but I think you're going to hear from four extraordinary individuals uh, who have something to say about nutrition, uh, about the challenges that we have around the world in terms of food insecurity, and the role that dairy can play uh, in meeting those challenges. You know, the, the World, food, uh, world Food Program has acknowledged that there is a heavy cost to malnutrition. It is a driver of poverty and inequality around the world. It limits educational and occupational opportunities. It stunts growth and can cause death among the world's poorest and among the world's youngest. And there's a double burden associated with malnutrition. In addition to not having enough to eat, we often find that it also impacts and affects, ironically, obesity. The panel today is charged 
by the World Food Prize Foundation with explaining how dairy and dairy products might be an effective tool in helping to control malnutrition and how it might help and aid in assisting all of us in reaching many of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. I suspect that this incredible panel will touch on a number of key points. You might hear today the role of protein from a dairy perspective, that it has indeed a high-ranking protein that can assist with recovery from malnutrition, while also helping to optimize body composition and to stem obesity. You might hear from this panel information that will dispel the myth that dairy might be too expensive to be used in this fight, that that high recovery rate can be reached at a cost of uh, as little as a penny per day. You might hear from these uh, experts how it can assist in the reduction of stunning, something that I think we all ought to be concerned about when one out of four children uh, starts their lives in a stunted circumstance which can result in poor school performance, lower lifetime incomes, and declining health in later years. We have today four experts. Mary Hennigan is the Nutrition Advisor at the Catholic Relief Services. And Mary is going to explain in part the important role that NGOs play in promoting good nutrition and preventing stunning and some of the challenges the Catholic Relief Services has faced. Joining her is Greg Miller, who is the Global Chief Science Officer at the National Dairy Council. And he's the Executive Vice President for Research, Regulatory, and Scientific Affairs at Dairy Management Incorporated. Greg has done and continues to do research and will tell you about how that research reflects on the effectiveness of dairy and dairy products in providing nutrition and recovery from malnutrition. Joining us as well is Lauren Landis, who is the Director of Nutrition Division at the World Food Program. Lauren was a driving force behind the World Food Program's 2017 nutrition strategy and reflecting on the importance of proper nutrition and the obstacles and challenges in providing products that can provide that nutrition. And finally, Chris Polizinski is the CEO of Land Lakes, and Chris is here from Minnesota to talk about the role that his company and, for that matter, corporate, the corporate world has in addressing these challenges and where there is a disconnect between the corporate world and the efforts of nonprofits and other organizations. Land of Lakes has been heavily involved in international development and rural development in developing countries, and I think Chris brings an interesting perspective as a CEO. We'll have statements from these panelists. Uh, I'll ask a question or two, and then we'll open it up uh, for a question or two in the remaining time. I want to take this opportunity to thank Ambassador Quinn and the staff of the World Food Prize Foundation for the opportunity to have this conversation. Over the course of the last four days here in Des Moines, there have been a variety of conversations about nutrition, about the importance of agricultural production and research, about how science is playing a role in increasing productivity, uh, the legacy of Norman Borlaug, people from all over the world discussing uh, new research, new innovation, new opportunities. But oftentimes what's missed in this conversation is the role that individual food products can play in providing nutrition. And I think there's probably no better example uh, of that than uh, dairy. Uh, there is such incredible diversity within dairy uh, that it can provide a number of products that can meet the nutritional needs of people around the world and can make a difference. So I hope that you'll find this to be an interesting conversation and discussion. And again, I want to thank the World Food Prize for this opportunity and thank our panelists for taking the time and coming uh, significant distances to be here today. So with that, I'm going to sit down. I'm going to turn it over to Mary. And we're just going to go Mary, Greg, Lauren, Chris with their uh, statements. Uh, several of them have slides. Uh, and then we'll uh, do the Q&A uh, and hope that uh, we get finished relatively on time because we know there's a small celebration that follows this. Right. Thank you very much for this privilege to be here. This year is the 75th anniversary of Catholic Relief Services. And we were founded by the US Catholic bishops to 
work internationally and in feeding the poor and, and working in for very vulnerable populations. And over the past 75 years, our role has evolved from food aid and, and just provisions of, of services to a nutrition-centric partnership with government, uh, researchers, donors, civil society, and communities. And I want to talk about that partnership today. Um, this partnership really formed at this, when the Sun Movement galvanized so many nations to work on national nutrition plans. And these national nutrition plans helped us start to coordinate and develop our role in accordance to national plans to address stunting and address malnutrition. Up until that time, we were sort of pretty much free to do what we wanted to do, where we wanted to do in, in countries. So the national nutrition plans gave us opportunity to focus and to support the scale up of these evidence-based interventions. And I was very pleased to learn recently that our staff in Kenya was asked by the government of Kenya to help in the revision of the national nutrition plan there, specifically to look at the protocols for children with disabilities and nutrition. So that opens up a whole new way of, of a population that we hadn't thought of as children with disabilities who are also stunted. Um, we also work, for example, in Rwanda. And in Rwanda, we work with the government in rolling out their national nutrition plan, and we cover 25% of the country's um, districts. So we've been able to, to really focus our interventions on these um, with government and scaling it up. And how do we do that is through donors like USAID and DFIT who have really been out front in encouraging government ownership and country ownership of stunting and nutrition um, plans. In Burundi, for example, we teamed up with USAID in 2010 to do a five-year program specifically designed to roll out USAID's um, strategy for reducing stunting. And we reached 50,000 households. And this, re this um, Title II program had a very large randomized trial on top of it so that you say could study the effects of their interventions on stunting. And I'm happy to announce that last month the, the, the findings were, re were released. And as part of those findings, it really demonstrated that NGOs like CRS have a role in helping governments and donors look at what's, what they're doing, how do you implement their plans, and one of the big questions that I raised in the presentation of the findings was there was no dairy. We looked at plant-based supplements. We, we looked at all sorts of nutrition education. We might have talked about animal source protein, but we did not look at um, the, the studies are limited to plant-based interventions. We also use our private funding to, to convene and we convened different types of partners. Last year in Nairobi, Kenya, we convened 300 people who represented governments, civil society, private sectors, and, and small businesses and governments to address the issue of the private sector in nutrition. And what struck me the most was that small businesses and the president of Land O'Lakes were there and their commitment to nutrition. And as an NGO, maybe I had stood off a little on the side about private sectors and nutrition. But this really resonated on their work and, and dedication to reducing stunting and finding solutions. Um, CRS is in 90 countries. And we were over 90 countries, depending on the day. Uh, we worked a lot with small farmers and local businesses. One of our, our, our secrets is that we're a multi-sector agency. So we don't look at nutrition totally from a nutrition-specific point of view. We can also address issues around 
consumer demands, helping consumers become informed, households become informed about what decisions they make on nutrition. And, and one of the ways we've looked at it is how do couples make decisions in the household? Often a woman understands what her child needs. Often she knows what to buy. But maybe her husband, who controls maybe the money, has, doesn't have that same understanding. So we spend a lot of time on couples' communications and household decision-making for nutrition. And this sets up opportunities for the private sector to really um, work with us in, in terms of of products so that people make informed decisions. In Guatemala, for example, we're trying to make sure people aren't just buying junk food, and literally that is like no more Coca-Cola or no more sodas, but let's look at other types of pro, uh, pro, um, foods that are um, healthy. We also um, recognize that while we can lift people out of poverty, and we can help feed them for today. The real future is in programs like early childhood development and, and girls' education that will pay off in the long run. And this has been very important to take a look at integrating early childhood development because if you have a child who isn't stunted, you really want that child to have a holistic um, development program. So we've been doing a lot of ECD with governments with civil societies and other actors. And of course, our partnership is really at community level, and we work with communities to help form, help them become advocates for their own nutrition. And I just wanna, um, we could spend hours talking about how you do that, but I really wanna talk about something that is near and dear to me. I think one of the hopeful signs for more sustainable nutrition in the future is the increasing number of national nutritionists in each country. And this is links communities to the national agendas. And, I, and I'm really pleased that so many more NGOs, private sector, governments are finding ways of employing well-trained um, nutritionists. I think for, in terms of having these nutritionists on the grounds, we can start to answer some of the questions around dairy because up until now, it's always been a plant-based issue. But I think having this local understanding of culture, this local understanding of, of the factors that influence malnutrition in a particular country, Dairy is going to be an important factor. Um, dairy will become a question that we can address in the future. So um, I think now's a good time to start talking about dairy and putting them back into the national nutrition plans and making NGOs like CRS promote some of these products. All right, thank you. Greg, speaking of nutrition. Um, I think we've got the wrong slides. <laughs> There we go. Okay, I'm gonna jump right in. Good afternoon. Uh, we've got a lot to cover and I've only got five minutes, so please put on your seatbelts. Um, we're gonna try to move along here real quickly. Um, I recently served on a high-level panel of experts for the United Nations to develop a report on nutrition and food systems. And as I participated in this, uh, this group, I learned a lot. And one of the key things is the link between nutrition and sustainability is really characterized by a growing tension to respond to intersecting challenges. We have a growing population out there. We're going to need to produce more food, um, 30 to 40 percent more food. And not only is our population growing in numbers, they're growing in size. Uh, we have an obesity epidemic that's uh, across the globe. Uh, but unfortunately, those folks who are getting too many calories are often not getting the nutrients that they need. We see deficiency of calcium, iron, potassium, fiber. Um, and so they're undernourished. They're overfed but undernourished. Um, we have food insecurity, and yet we're wasting or, or losing a third of the food that we're producing. Um, that's just shameful, and we need to deal with that issue. And, and what this really says to me is that not only are we gonna need to produce more food, we're gonna need to produce more of the right kinds of foods, nutrient-rich foods, like dairy foods, and we're gonna have to do it in a way that minimizes our environmental impact 
and uh, minimizes our use of natural resources. The UN recently approved the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. Um, this is the agenda for 2030 for the UN. This is their goal to move forward. And they said, for, in order for us to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals, we're going to have to look at it through a particular lens as we approach uh, that. We're going to have to use the triple bottom line approach of sustainability. And that means planet, people, and prosperity. Those are going to have to be in equi equilibrium for it to really be sustainable. Um, they also added a couple other dimensions, um, partnerships, because they realized that the civil society, governments, and private sector are all going to have to work together and come to the table if we are really going to achieve these sustainable development goals. And the other dimension they added is peace. Certainly without peace, it's going to be very difficult to achieve the sustainable development goals. And, and so uh, the further we move along in achieving those sustainable development goals, hopefully it will bring more peace to the planet, and hopefully that will allow us to get there. But at the heart of attaining these sustainable development goals is nutrition. And that's clearly evidenced by the UN passing the decade of nutrition. The UN has focused their efforts solely on nutrition. They understand without food and nutrition security across the globe, we will not be able to achieve our sustainable development goals. We think dairy can contribute to that, and we certainly think as we look at it through the, the various lenses and the various dimensions, dairy can play a very significant and important role. Dairy provides good nutrition to people. Every day, six billion people across the globe get up and consume dairy as a part of their healthy diet. Dairy provides affordable, accessible, culturally diverse, nutrient-rich foods that people can consume. And dairy provides nutrition 365 days of the year. There isn't a season for dairy. Every day, dairy is being produced across the globe to feed our growing, our growing planet. In the dimension of planet, the dairy sector has committed to reducing its environmental footprint. And this is evidenced by the dairy sustainability framework. If you go online and look for this, this is dairy reporting on its commitment to continuous improvement in terms of its environmental footprint. We're reporting on 11 different dimensions in terms of soil health, water, biodiversity, animal care, um, working conditions, and other dimensions as well. Another way dairy can enable a sustainable food system is with dairy cows. Most people don't realize dairy cows are great recyclers. They take things that we can't consume and turn it into nutrient-rich food. Uh, 80 to 90% of what we feed dairy cattle is non-human consumable. There are food production byproducts such as almond shells, um, spent brewer's grains, citrus peels. All of that is, is waste that could go into landfills, but we're feeding it to cattle. They're recycling it and turning it into nutrient-rich dairy foods with high-quality protein that we can consume and be nourished by. Animal care, of course, is important, and, animal, and dairy farmers have committed across the globe to good animal care and to good care of their land. Um, in the U.S., they've been doing that. We produce a gallon of milk now with 90% less land, 65% less greenhouse gases, and 63% less water use than we did 70 years ago. Dairy contributes to prosperity. It's very important to rural economies, these dairy farms. Across the globe, there are 600 million people who live on dairy farms, and that's their livelihood, and it contributes to rural economies. 400 million people, their livelihood is tied to the dairy sector. They're either selling inputs into the dairy farm, or they're purchasing the milk, processing the milk, transporting the milk, or selling the dairy products that are made from milk. That means every day, one billion people on this planet, their livelihood is tied to the dairy sector. And that's very important for those economies. Dairy's shown its commitment to partnerships. We partner with the full dairy sector to report on our continuous improvement through the dairy sustainability framework. Um, we signed the Dairy Declaration of Rotterdam. That was in October of 2016. It was an agreement signed by the International Dairy Federation and FAO to show our joint commitment to partner to help achieve the sustainable development goals. So globally, the dairy industry has shown its commitment to work hard against these sustainable development goals. So when we look at the dairy sector contributing to all these critical areas, we are really here to work to create a sustainable food system that creates a healthier food environment that will create healthier people and a healthier planet. Thank you.
Thanks, Greg. Lauren. <clears throat> One of the benefits of going third is I think I can, all the topics will just be a continuation. Uh, the World Food Program works in about 80 different countries. In about 54 of them, we do nutrition-specific programming. Um, that covers about 12.8 uh, million people worldwide. And about half of those are in emergency environments. Um, when you think of the World Food Program, if you know the World Food Program, you're probably thinking of emergency food aid, large scale in, in large emergencies. We've been doing that for about 50 years, but one of the things that we've realized is that it's not just about getting that food to the most remote areas, but it's also about nourishing people, and so therefore you've really got to make sure that you're getting more than just the calories, that you've really got to get the nutrients that the particular uh, age group or vulnerability, pre pregnant and lactating women or under twos, need to li live healthy lives. So one of the things that you'll see as the World Food Program has written its new strategic plan based on these sustainable development goals, we've selected two of them. Two, getting to zero hunger, and 17, partnership, is the ones that we will put most of our effort to, though, most of you in the room know that nutrition is linked to almost all of the SDGs. The red circle is the only thing you need to look at on this slide in the sense that nutrition is now one of the strategic objectives or strategic results of the World Food Program. So giving it a much higher profile to say that it's not just about getting the food there, but getting the right food there. As we develop this new uh, strategic plan or new management plan for the World Food Program, we've also written a new nutrition policy that goes hand in hand with it. And again, really saying, as Mary has already said, the need to focus on national plans and implement what governments want to do, not just what the World Food Program might think is appropriate. And really focusing on all forms of mal malnutrition, um, which goes all the way from wasting and stunting to micronutrient deficiencies, as well as overweight and obesity, which is such a growing problem globally. And then again, focusing on diets and really making sure that we're thinking about both uh, all the food systems that are related to getting the most appropriate local diet and not bringing in that diet uh, from exported or from imported sources. And clearly also, as this chart tries to show, also working in partnership. This slide I don't want to spend a lot of time on except for have you look quickly at the three yellow boxes because really what we're trying to say here is it's not only about access and availability to safe and nutritious foods that we want to focus on in the World Food Program as part of our nutrition, nutrition policy, but we also want to look at the creating and expanding the demand and consumption of local nutritious food that's new for the World Food Program and something that I think resonates with a lot of things that I've heard today. So we are uh, focused on diets, national plans, all forms of malnutrition, partnership, and particularly looking at nutrition-sensitive programming. For those of you that know the World Food Program, we you do, for example, a lot of school feeding globally, worldwide. And this is an important social safety net where you can reach children with things like milk that it can have a really important impact on their lives. So how can we do what the uh, World Food Program has done for years, for decades, and put a nutrition lens on it? How can we make sure that when we're procuring from smallholders and using the power of our procurement that we think through a nutrition lens? When we're building uh, infrastructure assets, can we think about it through a nutrition lens? Even when we're handing out cash for people to buy the foods that they need in local ma markets, what can we also do to make sure they think about it uh, from a nutrition perspective. So I just wanted to say one other thing, which is how do we use milk? And really, we have been thinking about milk for a number of years, but we realize that milk is really just an important nutritious component of the diets. 
uh, of the children uh, and other beneficiaries that we're trying to reach. And we really look at it in two ways. One, uh, straight up, straight up as milk, yogurt, cheese, et cetera, as a commodity that goes into a ration that we provide. But we also look at it very closely as an ingredient for products such as specialized nutrition uh, foods, whether it's for treatment of acute malnutrition, either moderate or severe, and also for supporting growth and development. So say in complementary baby foods uh, that are fed to children after uh, exclusive breastfeeding. We're really, for younger children, much more use, interested in using it as an ingredient um, because we're very much uh, concerned about encouraging uh, full and complete breastfeeding from zero to six months. So I'll stop there and hopefully we'll still have some time for questions. Great. Um, no thank you. Um, one of the challenges of going last is to try not to be redundant to all the good comments you just heard about the role of dairy in a nutritious, nutritious diet. So let me focus on the role of the private sector in improving nutrition in developing economies. Why is that important and, and what can private sector companies do? Uh, so first, let me take a half a step back and, and just uh, 30 seconds to describe Land Lakes and tell you why our opinion even counts in this matter, because after all, most of you think of us as the butter company. And indeed, that is true. Uh, we were formed in the early 20s by a bunch of dairy farmers in the upper Midwest to aggregate their supply and market their dairy products. Uh, what most people don't know is very, very shortly after that, they formed an animal feed division and a crop inputs division, seed, crop nutrients, crop protection products. Uh, to bargain for them and do things for them better, faster, or cheaper they can, than they could do on their own. So if you turn the clock forward nearly 100 years, those are our three business units. We've grown quite a bit. We're a Fortune 500 company with Fortune 200 company with about $15 billion in sales. And uh, a cool part of it is we're still farmer owned. The neatest part of our company, though, is those farmers who owned us as an outgrowth of their rural values about 40 years ago said, you know, we know a lot about getting food from farm to market. There are a lot of places in the world that seems to be a struggle. Let's form a nonprofit organization and go do that work. So we've been very involved in global development, like a lot of the brilliant organizations uh, here and, and in this room, uh, for nearly four decades, um, nearly 100 companies, hundreds and hundreds of projects. Um, so we are opinionated. We do have a perch that sees the food industry end to end. That perch is informed by be being farmer owned and we are indeed a private sector organization. But we have this oddity for private sector companies which is a four decades owned global development, old global development organization. So, um, you know, what, what do we see from this perch? And what is the role of both global development organizations and the private sector. Well, first, when we look at our, our, our development business, Land Lakes International Development, a very creative name, um, there isn't a project we have that doesn't have nutrition built into it. Right now, we have 16 projects in Africa, and every one of them has a nutrition component somehow, some way. It might be very directly. In Ethiopia, we're partnering with Save the Children to focus on vulnerable populations, uh, women and children, in the first thousand days. And, working to ensure that they have a balanced nutritious diet. Very direct nutrition component. Without going into the detail in the other projects we have, which are funded largely by USAID or USDA, some private uh, foundation funding, broadly speaking, what we're trying to do in all of those projects as it relates to nutrition is build much more resilient food systems that are high yielding. That's foundational to nutrition having a predictable, diverse set of crops. Not unpredictable and not narrow. A predictable, diverse set of crops. So that's what's happening on our development side of the business. And it really is very directly tethered to some of the learning, I think, in the, developing, uh, the development uh, uh, community around it's not just calories, it's the right calories. We also see from that perch is we can grow things in lots of different environments in lots of different conditions, sometimes surprisingly challenging. Our issue, and we're making progress, our issue is accelerating that progress and scaling what we know we can do. That's where the private sector comes in. And right now, I'll be honest, from our perch, humbly, there's a disconnect. Um, I think a lot of development organizations have looked at the private sector as kind of hands off. Who are these folks? 
These folks, in my view, can be your best friends to accelerate and scale the brilliant work that you've done for decades. Right now, if you go talk to my private sector colleagues, they'd say, we get it, Africa's gonna be everybody's growth market at some point in time, but geez, we can't quite figure out how to make a business proposition work. Capitalism doesn't allocate resources well against highly uncertain or long-term projects. And we're in a long-term trend to improve nutrition, right? How about if we talk to each other a little bit more? And how about if private sector folks worked with development folks and said, you know, you're actually not just doing development, you're building a safe, affordable raw material supply for us to develop a marketplace. Hmm. Might that attract investment? Might that attract folks to say, I can actually build a processing facility and maybe even give you some money to accelerate the development work you've done and create a microeconomy? Because I do see, as a private sector, a payoff, meaning a marketplace that develops. It's what's happening now on a slower pace. So I think the comment I would make around the private sector's role in improving nutrition is that we actually have to start to talk to one another. The great development organizations uh, that have been in place doing brilliant work for years need to embrace the private sector and say, come on in, the water's just fine and we will help you build that raw material supply to serve those emerging markets. And by the way, when you think about it, there's an economic sustainability comment here too. Think about who goes to work in those factories. You pay them, they're your consumer base. It is what's happening now, but we can just accelerate it. Chris, that's a great, uh, a great opportunity for me to segue with both Mary and Lauren. So Chris has put the challenge out um, to organizations like the World Food Program Catholic Relief Services, what advice would you give Chris in terms of how to make that connection, how to get dairy more on the uh, sort of the radar screen of these organizations? What, what advice, what counsel would you give uh, us today? Uh, what's the first thing we ought to be doing as an industry to make that connection more effectively? Mary, Lauren? I, I think for me, I would answer that question by helping us become more aware of what you're doing and understanding more of the science because there's been such a negative view on dairy. And I just, I felt it this week when I told some colleagues from other organizations that I was going to be here talking about dairy and they went, what? And it was like, okay, there's a whole science out there that, that could really help us out. And I think there's opportunities to really start to educate. Early or in my talk, I mentioned Coca-Cola. I happen to think they're one of the best companies around in terms of their delivery mechanisms to the furthest areas of the world. How do we learn from that? It's not to say Coke is bad or, or push them aside, but how do we work with them to make sure that some of these products that are hard to reach are able to be reached, what's the supply chain? So I think there is dialogue, but it's helping us come to realize the impact and the science and the technology of it. Um, and it. And I think for too long, NGOs have been sort of like looking at things from, we're gonna serve the poor, but I think we have to also figure out that by, by Serving the poor means that we also have to find the best mechanisms for them to be lifted out of poverty, and that includes the private sector. Just to add to that, I, I think what I would say is that you need to go to the countries, and I think, I, I think I've seen more of that, and we know that. But one of the things that has come out of the, the Sun movement for nutrition is the Sun Business uh, Network, and I really see that revving up not so much at the global level these days, but really in individual countries where they can bring together small and medium-sized enterprises with the goal to work on nutrition. And that's maybe the platform to kind of get that science known, to make sure that those health benefits of dairy are clearly understood, and then see if there's a business proposition that can be done that is for that consumer group. So that would be one suggestion. Greg, I know that you probably are chomping at the bit 
to provide us uh, in a short period of time all we need to know about the nutritional value of dairy. So let me give you an opportunity to educate all of us about the science that has emerged recently about dairy in terms of nutrition, nutritional value, and what other research do you think uh, we ought to be focused on in order to make the case more effectively? Yeah. Well, uh, clearly, you know, the science on, on dairy is really strong and really solid in terms of dairy is a nutrient-rich food. People that, who tend to consume more dairy tend to have nutritionally better diets. Dairy consumption has been associated with re reduced risk of cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, lower blood pressure, lower weight, and lower body fat. And again, I work for the dairy industry, so um, don't take my word. Go read the Dietary Guidelines for Americans. In the Dietary Guidelines, they're the ones who have uh, looked at all the available science and put that on the table and said, in the, in the Dietary Guidelines for Americans, we need three servings of dairy each day as part of a healthy diet, and showed that relationship. So, so that's pretty solid from, from that point of view. Um, if, if I were um, king of the world in terms of research and, and what we need to do now, I think we've got a lot of good basic science. I would look now for more applied science. How do we do more to show how dairy can be delivered into programs, the value that dairy brings in terms of nutritional quality of the diet, health benefits, reduced risk of non-communicable diseases? As, as we wrote this report for the UN, one of the things that the UN asked for was more experiential knowledge um, in terms of what really works out there in the field. Um, how can, you, can we do more demonstration products that show that when you bring dairy in, you en enhance the livelihood of people, um, you give them a cow, and all of a sudden they've got nutrition 365 days of the year. They can get a more diverse diet because now they have an income because they can sell some of that milk. So I think I would look for more applied kinds of projects to really uh, demonstrate how dairy delivers. Has there been research on the impact on, on growth uh, of young children? Yes, in fact, um, there have been trials that have been done in using dairy protein relative to plant proteins in terms of its ability to um, accelerate growth after um, mild acute malnutrition. And there's really good data saying that high quality dairy protein really can accelerate recovery. Um, and it makes sense to me because if you look at the quality protein quality, you've got to eat 30 to 40% more plant protein to get the same nutritional quality that you get from animal source protein. So there's a big difference in terms of protein quality. And that goes to the cost issue. Yes. Chris? Yeah. I want to come back to the broad comment of, of science and, and having uh, the development community really look at the science around nutrition, the role of dairy in a nutritious uh, diet, uh, diet fact-based, science-based, and the role of science and technology in building more resilient crops. Because again, that's part of bringing the public sector, the private sector, into this game. When they see a abundant, more abundant, uh, predictable raw material supply, they can have a business proposition, and they can accelerate the work that you all have done and are doing so brilliantly. It doesn't change what you're doing; it just changes the rate of progress against bringing the power against the. Uh, objective of improving nutrition for more and more people. It brings the power of the marketplace. But I can't emphasize enough from the perch we have, and we're opinionated, I know that doesn't make us right. Getting to a science-based platform around what the products are that contribute to a nutritious diet, not fact, not opinion, not, uh, not, opinion, not nostalgia, but a science-based view, and a science-based view of how to build more resilient food systems, crops that feed more nutritious crops on their own, or the dairy industry itself. That's the basis around which you'll see more business propositions take root. If I, I could just add, you know, one of the things that frightens me most as a scientist is that so many people are bringing emotion to the table in terms of how they interpret the science. Um, you know, they're bringing what they feel and what they think rather than being unemotional and fact-based. And um, that really frightens me at times because we want to make good policy. We got to make it from good science. All right, we've got about five minutes left. Uh, there's a roving mic. Uh, if there are questions, now is the time for folks to ask them. Um, and if there are, oh, well, good, we've got a question over here. Yes, sir. Jim Hershey with the American Soybean Association's WISH program. Um, good to see you again, Secretary Vilsack, and a wonderful panel. As Rav Shah uh, pointed out, uh, protein comes in many forms, of course. Uh, dairy is a great one, uh, soy and, and uh, other products as well. 
It's a specific, crucial nutrient that's often overlooked in diets. So how can we help nutrition programs and their designers, um, consumers and their private sector suppliers understand the power of protein specifically uh, to uh, prevent stunting? Who wants to take that? Just. Oh, um, it goes to, I think, education and also, excuse me, lost my mic. Uh, sort of some working with the donor community and I think USAID and others, what is the right formulation of some of the food assistant programs we have? And then it's also working with universities and, and the training of nutritionists and others in, in, in really getting back to the issue of, of protein and, and, and dairy source protein. I think we have to also be very cognizant that we cannot give up the fight for, for breastfeeding and we must keep that fight alive. And I think sometimes part of this argument around dairy has been pushed to the side for the issue around breastfeeding. And we, we must have this dual message that says breastfeeding is the best for babies and then we will enter into dairy in other areas of, of the child's life. But there's no question that I think we've had a debate going on is we don't want to give up that breastfeeding battle. And, and I think we have to really hold our, our steps on that one and then make sure that there's also room for dairy as part of the diet going forward. I just, uh, I couldn't stress that more. Just really designing programs so that you enhance the breastfeeding but taking advantage of the protein uh, of milk. And one of the ways that you're going to get that adopted around the world, and it's a slow and painful, difficult way, I can admit, is that the quality of that milk protein has to be accepted and adopted in WHO standards. Because when you go into countries and you say, let's go this way, they say, what, is, what do the WHO guidelines say? And often, in order to really get that done, you need solid science, good evidence, and well-documented. And, and so that's where we have to go. Greg, does that sound science and solid science exist today? Uh, yes, it does. There, there's, good, there's more probably to be done, uh, spoken like a true scientist. Um, but um, yes, there is good solid science. We do need some more. So Chris, does the private sector have a role in advocating in these uh, organizations or advocating governments to, to, be, to inject this conversation into these organizations? And, and how, how could the private sector be more effective in that effort? Yeah, I, I think we have to talk to each other because I think there's, there's role for, roles for all of us. There's roles for uh, governments, um, government, to gov government communications, there's role for traditional development organizations, and there's roles for uh, the private sector. And broadly speaking, I really, and the theme of my comments is bringing the power of the marketplace to accelerate development around providing better nutrition, in our case, dairy. Um, that is the role of the private sector. They need help from uh, traditional development organizations in, uh, in developing the foundational uh, uh, capabilities to provide a raw material supply. That depends on governments having a rule of law. Uh, that's honored. So we all have roles, and I think we have to talk about this together and get out of our silos, because the private sector right now does look at Africa, and I will tell you, most everybody I know says one of these days that's going to be our greatest growth market. My response is, get in the game now, and it'll be there faster. If I talk to NGOs, they talk about the pace of change in whatever the objective is. In this case, dairy nutrition. Dairy as it plays a role in nutrition. We get it, but if we can only go faster. I think we have to talk to each other and coordinate our activities, and indeed, we'll be able to accelerate our progress. Well, the, uh, the timer has shut the timer off, which indicates that, uh, that we've, we've run out of time. And I think what I learned from this, uh, this panel discussion is the need for the World Food Prize Foundation to have this panel back again next year for round two, because uh, this is a topic, I think, that lends itself to much more uh, discussion and opportunity for the folks to be engaged in conversation. So please uh, join me in thanking the panel uh, for this great conversation.
What a great day of really thoughtful discussion. And thank you again so much to our panelists. Really wonderful. And we'd be happy to have you back, I think I can safely say, on behalf of Ambassador Quinn. So um, tonight's the big night, everybody. The Laureate Awards ceremony will be happening shortly. Um, I just have a couple of notes that I want to make sure I say before everyone departs. The uh, buses uh, to the Capitol will begin loading now. They're loading at 5 o'clock. Uh, by windows on the first floor, that's on 7th Street. For those of you who don't have a ticket, we're still gonna have a party here at the Marriott. There's a viewing party on the second floor at Rock River. And for those of you who are going, be sure that you have these three things, your ticket, your badge, and a photo ID. That's very important. You will not be able to get up to the Capitol without those three things. So please make sure you have them. I hope you all have a wonderful evening and we'll see you here tomorrow morning.